And if non-members could stop their video until we move into our program, that might be helpful. Once I see that it's good, I'll give you a quick little, quick little go ahead. Just have to make sure it loads. Here comes Representative Bloom. We are live. Wonderful. Non-members could stop their video until. Uh oh. Someone has their YouTube playing. It was me. It's gone now. Okay. It's, now. <laughs> right. it's a little delay on the YouTube, and so you, if you have it playing while you're also live in the meeting, there's an echo. Um, okay, so we are. Uh, our meeting is live. Welcome to uh, Wednesday, January 27th, uh, Joint Standing Committee for the Environment and Natural Resources. Um, I'm Senator uh, Stacey Brenner, and I'm the Senate Chair of the committee, and uh, I represent Scarborough, Buxton, and Gorham in Senate District 30. Um, looking forward to a, a great conversation today about the Climate Council report that was commissioned by the committee in the 129th. Um, my hope is that we could go around and have each of the committee members quickly introduce themselves and then we'll move into our program. Um, and when you're not speaking, if you could make sure to keep yourself muted. And if you want to address the committee and have questions, if you could use the raise hand feature uh, and we'll call on you. Um, I'll try to be paying as close attention as I can to the order to which you raise your hands um, so that I have a cue, um, but please be patient uh, as we all learn how to do this together. All right. Um, I'm gonna call on you <clears throat> to introduce yourselves um, because you are all going to appear slightly differently in each other's screens in terms of the order of your squares. Um, Representative Tool. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be joining everyone today. I'm Representative Will Toole. I represent the Machias area plus Lubeck in Eastport. This is my fourth term. I'm also on state and local government. So I'm spending a lot of time there, but it's an honor to be with you all today. Thank you. And Representative O'Connor. Representative O'Connor, you're still Thank muted. you. Thank yeah. you. Yep, it just didn't click. Good morning. I am Representative Beth O'Connor. I represent the individuals of House District 5, which is Berwick and North Berwick. And I look forward to the meeting. It's a pleasure to see you all today. And Representative Ziegler? Um, I've been having trouble with my, my mic. Can you hear me? Uh, all this okay. head's shaking, I think that's so. I'm Representative Paige Ziegler. I represent the district, uh, District 96, the seven towns of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Mapo, Morrill, Searsmont, and Palermo. Um, and I am looking forward to the meeting today, too. And Representative Johansson. Good morning. My name is Chris Johansson. I represent House District 145. The 18 organized towns between Bridgewater and Sherman. And Representative Hanley. Uh, good morning. I'm Jeff Hanley. I represent District 87, which is Piston, Alna, West Cassett, and Randolph. And I also serve on the tax committee. So I'll be occasionally leaving this committee to do other things, but don't take offense. Thank you. And Representative Bell. Good morning. Uh, my name is Art Bell. I represent Yarmouth, Shabik, and Long Island, House District 47, and I'm a first time legislator. And Representative Bloom. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lydia Bloom. I represent uh, the, the Coastal District of York, House District 3, and I'm a member of the, uh, the Climate Council, and I'm really looking forward to. Uh, seeing the presentation today. And Representative Dudera. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Vicki Dudera. I represent District 94, 
three towns on Penobscot Bay, Camden, Rockport, and the island of Islesboro. And Senator Carney. Good morning, everyone. My name's Ann Carney. I represent Senate District 29, which is South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and a little sliver of Scarborough. I also serve on and actually chair the Judiciary Committee. I will be here as much as possible, and I'm excited to hear today's presentation. And Senator Bennett. Thank you. I'm Rick Bennett. I represent uh, the most beautiful part of Maine, um, 13 towns. Uh, in uh, four in Cumberland County, the Lakes region and the Oxford Hills and the greater Freiburg area in Oxford County. And glad to be here. And I'm looking forward to asking some tough questions of my old friend, Speaker Pingree. And my uh, co-chair, Representative Tucker. Good morning. My name is Ralph Tucker. I'm broadcasting from Brunswick this morning. House District 50, and uh, this will be my fourth and last term in the legislature. Uh, my district is the next most beautiful district in the state. Um, we also have two fantastic uh, folks that are kind of the glue that keep us rolling uh, and moving along, um, Dan Tartikoff and uh, Sabrina. Carrie, um, do you all want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Dan Tartikoff, I'm the committee analyst. I'm Sabrina Carey. I am the committee clerk here in the committee room. And with that, I think I will, um, unless there are, oh, there's one other housekeeping item. Uh, we have to move forward on our committee rules. Um, we are hoping that there could perhaps be a representative from the Republican caucus and one from the Democratic caucus committee members who would be willing to have conversation about that and folks could reach out to them regarding any changes or additions to the rules um, and then next week we could plan the time for a conversation. Um, any volunteers are appreciated. I'm happy to volunteer. Wonderful, thank you, Representative Dudera. I'm happy to volunteer as well. Thank you, Representative O'Connor, wonderful. Very, so all the welcome. two of you connect offline and um, we'll go from there. So if you have any changes or addendums, additions, you'll reach out to either Representative Dudera or Representative O'Connor. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass the meeting over to Hannah Pingree and uh, Mel Melanie Loisum. Okay, I cannot start my video because the host stopped it. So I just need help with that. Yep, let me help you with that. Let's see if I can figure that out. You don't need to see me, especially with Senator Bennett already throwing it down. We'll, we'll, um, <laughs> and Melanie is out there too. Hopefully she can unmute herself. Um, yeah. Great. So just a, um, my name is Hannah Pingree. I'm the director of the governor's office of policy innovation in the future. And I am, uh, the co-chair of the Maine climate council with acting commissioner, Melanie Loisam. And we are going to give you, uh, a, a, overview today of the work of the Maine Climate Council, a little bit uh, of our process, as well as the recommendations that have come out in the December 1 report. Um, we're happy to answer questions, but we've also brought in um, a team of experts to give you kind of the full lowdown. Um, we have a couple of different panels after Melanie and I go through a PowerPoint presentation and questions. Um, our first um, after us is uh, two members, the co-chairs of our science and technical subcommittee will, will give you not the full accounting of their incredibly extensive science and technical committee um, report on the impacts of climate on Maine, but they're going to give you a good overview and happy to answer questions. Um, then we're going to hear from uh, Dan Burgess, the, the director of the governor's energy office, Joyce Taylor, the deputy commissioner of the Maine DOT, as well as Michael Stoddard. Uh, who is the head of Efficiency Maine, and they're going to go through um, the three working group reports that relate to how we reduce our carbon emissions in our energy sector, our building sector, and transportation. Um, 
After that, you're going to hear from three co-chairs who chaired what um, I would say are our resilience adaptation and sequestration working groups. So Commissioner Amanda Beal is going to talk about the work of the Natural Working Lands Group. Um, Kathleen Layden um, from DMR is going to talk about coastal and marine. And Judy East, um, now of the Land Use Planning Commission, is going to talk about the super group that worked on resilience, public health, um, and emergency management. Um, and I would say last but not least, we've invited a panel of our, I would say, both citizens and um, business leaders who participated in the Maine Climate Council. Um, we have uh, Melissa Law, a Maine farmer, Pat Strauch, head of the Maine Forest Products Council, Matt Marks, um, head of the AEGC contractors, as well as Jesse Perkins of the Bethel Chamber. So we really wanted to give you the full picture of our work, some of the details of what is in the Climate Action Plan, um, but also talk about um, citizen engagement in the Maine Climate Council. And I think one of the things we, we talked a lot about with, with this committee back, I, I think about a year and a half ago when we enacted this legislation is how action on climate can actually benefit rural communities benefit the main economy while also um, taking action on an issue that I know is important to, to all of you. So that's just the, I just wanted to give you the overview of the day. You can see it on your agenda, but I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the um, members of the Maine Climate Council who took some time out to be with you all. And I hope we can give you a helpful presentation. Um, I think as Representative Bloom mentioned, uh, she uh, was one of the two house members on the Maine Climate Council incredibly helpful supporter of this work. Um, she was with Dick Campbell, who's, who's no longer in the legislature, um, but very uh, committed and, and worked on the buildings and, and housing issues. Uh, Brownie Carson was the other Senate member um, uh, with Senator Woodsum, uh, no longer on this committee, but, but both of them were, were important supporters. So um, I am going to just attempt to share my screen and I think I can make that work. And then um, Melanie and I are going to tag team through a presentation and answer questions and then pass it off to our, our science and technical leads. Um, so just confirming that sounds good to you co-chairs, Senator Brenner and Representative Tucker. Yes, exactly what we are expecting. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, can everybody see this? You can all see it, great. We can, all right. yes. So, um, Again, you know, you know, Melanie and I, you'll, you'll see lots of our faces, especially Melanie's throughout this legislative session, but, you know, very grateful for her commitment. Uh, Jerry Reed started off as the co-chair of the Maine Climate Council. Melanie has taken over and is a former head of the Air Bureau, um, really has offered so much help and insight into this process and, and how we do this work in a meaningful way. So, I don't need to um, fully tell this this committee um, how Maine is tackling climate change is really uh, in partnership with the Maine legislature. Um, but I, I wanted to just talk about a few of the highlights of the, of the actions that were taken in the last legislature that created the Maine Climate Council um, and also other pieces of work that are, I would say, integral to the council's work. So obviously, um, in 2019, um, this committee passed LD 1679, which was sponsored by Senator David Woodsum. Um, we were grateful for overwhelming bipartisan support, I think unanimous support from this committee. Um, it was signed into law by the governor in June of 2019. Um, in addition to that legislative session, uh, the Maine legislature passed a renewable portfolio standard increase for our electricity sector. Um, requiring that 80% of Maine's energy um, be renewable by 2030 and a goal of 100% by 2050. Um, and I just want to highlight that because it, it was not part of the Maine Climate Council goal, but obviously um, incredibly important to our work overall. I think you'll learn more that a lot of the work and recommendations of the Climate Council are about moving towards electrification, um, I would say the, the RPS goal is already being implemented by the Maine PUC, and I think the good news is, um, as we had hoped, it is um, allowing the procurement of incredibly affordable power, but also power that is creating jobs in Maine, um, especially in the solar sector, but also in, in wind and hydro and biomass. So I think that is um, good news. Um, Obviously lots of other activity around solar and, and Dan, I'll let Dan Burgess and others talk about that later today. And we also passed a goal 
um, to install 100,000 new heat pumps in Maine by 2025. And, and Michael Stoddard can hit on that, but we are already making um, really good progress um, uh, installing, I think, almost 17,000 heat pumps in this last, last year. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Melanie to really go through the, the process of what is the Maine Climate Council, um, how did we do our work, and then we'll get into sort of a brief overview of the strategies and, and then uh, let some of our real uh, working group experts get into more detail. So uh, I will pass it off to Melanie. Thanks, Anna. Um, as Hannah has highlighted, the Maine Climate Council structure and objectives are governed by Maine law. The new law established two ambitious targets to reduce gross greenhouse gas emissions and instructions to ensure the state also builds resiliency to the impacts of climate change. Also, as Hannah mentioned, Governor Mills has given us an additional goal for the state to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. So the Climate Council was charged with developing the plan to meet these targets and goals and continuing this planning work to produce updated plans every four years. And as I think you're all aware, the first plan has been released as of December 1st, 2020. Next slide. Thanks, Anna. So the DEP has been tracking greenhouse gas emissions in Maine since 2004. We use methods that were developed by the Environmental Protection Agency, and we take data from a variety of federal and state sources, in particular, the Energy Information Administration. As you can see here, by far the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Maine comes from our transportation sector. That's followed by 19% of emissions from residential sources. That's us heating our homes. 11% of emissions come from the commercial sector, also largely from building heating. So that's three quarters of Maine's greenhouse gas emissions that are associated just with transportation and heating. Our industrial and electrical generating sectors are actually the smallest contributors of greenhouse gas emissions in Maine at nine and 7%. Next. This graph is an example of the information from the Department of Environmental Protection's Greenhouse Gas Emission uh, Biennial Report. Last year, we published our eighth biennial report. And I must say that it's nice to have people taking an interest in it now. So statute established 1990 as the baseline year for us to track emissions from. And originally the law set a greenhouse gas emission reduction target of returning to 1990 levels by the year 2000, and then reducing emissions further by 10% below 1990 levels by 2020. So Maine met both of those goals, as you can see here on the graph. Um, also after emissions peaked in the early 2000s. The majority of the reductions that occurred happened in the industrial and electrical sectors and through switching from higher carbon fuel sources like coal and residual oil to other fuels that emit less carbon uh, when combusted like natural gas. So now meeting our future targets is going to require more advanced technology and strategies like renewable sources of energy for our cars and homes. Next. With these goals in mind, Scientists, industry leaders, and local and state officials, many of whom you'll hear from today, were brought together to form a 39-member council, six working groups, and the Science and Technical Subcommittee for a total of more than 230 members from across the state of Maine. The working groups focused on specific areas to develop recommended strategies, while the Science and Technical Subcommittee developed objective science-based assessments of the impact of climate change in Maine. As a result of this work, the council also decided to create a new equity subcommittee to ensure that implementation of our climate strategies considers the diverse needs of Mainers. Next, sorry. So you'll hear more detail from our presenters later, but a lot was accomplished since LD 1679 became law. Members of the council and the working groups were appointed in September, 2019. The working groups met monthly to evaluate information about the effects of climate change in Maine and to develop mitigation and adaptation recommendations for the broader council's consideration. Despite COVID, members communicated and collaborated with the help of an amazing facilitator, the Consensus Building Institute, and the incredible staff from Hannah's office in the Office of Policy Innovation in the future. The council pressed forward. 
I can't emphasize enough how much work those folks did to help us get through this, particularly during these unusual times. The working groups and the science and technical subcommittee delivered the recommendations to the council this past summer. And then the council deliberated on those recommendations and came up with a final set of strategies that are now embodied in the plan that was presented on December 1st. Next. In its deliberations, the council was informed by several scientific and technical analyses. The Science and Technical Subcommittee provided a summary of the impacts of climate change in Maine in their report, as well as specific projections like estimates of relative sea level rise over the next century. Consultants provided an economic analysis and greenhouse gas modeling of the draft strategies that came from the working groups. They also produced vulnerability maps highlighting some of the major impacts of climate change as well as the cost of doing nothing estimates or those predicted costs to the state from climate change if there was no change to current policies. The council also worked with the University of Maine's Mitchell Center to assess the recommendations of the six working groups from an equity perspective. For each of the working group strategies, the Mitchell Center evaluated how it would affect vulnerable populations and they suggested improvements to those strategies for an equitable distribution of benefits. The Governor's Energy Office and GOPIF also released a plan to identify pathways and strategies for the advancement of Maine's clean energy economy. That plan covers sectors like renewable energy and energy efficiency. So there's a lot of important information in all of these documents. They're all available on the Climate Council's webpage. And I believe they were uh, links were sent to you all as well prior to this meeting. Next slide. So ultimately, the council utilized all of this information to select strategies that are predicted to achieve the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets in Maine law. A variety of those strategies were modeled and considered by the council, and all of the presentations on those are also on the council's webpage. Next. So this table shows you those same modeled sector emissions numerically and how each sector of the greenhouse gas inventory will need to contribute to reductions over time to achieve those goals. In a moment, you'll see that a number of the proposed strategies, as Hannah mentioned, aim to reduce reliance on combustion of fossil fuels through efficiency and weatherization and by electrification of our transportation and building sectors. Next. Another way that we track emissions over time is in comparison to gross domestic product. This graph shows us that significant emission reductions have occurred while Maine's economy remains stable and grew. The council's, the council's plan recommends many strategies that will achieve further emission reductions and foster new economic growth. Next. So using all of this information and the expertise of all of its working groups, the council focused on four overarching goals, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, while also making Maine more resilient to the effects of climate change, fostering further growth and opportunity in Maine's economy, and advancing equitable outcomes for all Maine citizens. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Hannah. Great, thank you, Melanie. Um, so I'm, I'm now gonna walk through the overview of the strategies proposed by the working groups that were then considered by the council and then brought together in eight overarching climate action strategies. Um, I'll go through each of them briefly, but know again that behind me is coming uh, the, the working group co-chair experts who really can, can dive deep into the details and we'll give you a little bit more background as to who was involved in these strategies and, and more detail on, on how we will implement them. So I would say the first three okay. strategies. May, may I just ask a question? Or would you prefer to wait, uh, Chairman, Chair? Hannah, do you have a preference about questions along the way or questions held to the end? Senator Bennett's questions or any questions? <laughs> well, actually, I, it's kind of a threshold question. If you don't mind if I pose it right now, because I just, um, your, your data on, um, on greenhouse gas, gas emissions uh, that's very difficult to uh, assess, uh, as you know. Uh, and so, how, how what what is the source of that? How do you how do you measure that? I will definitely let um, the uh, acting commissioner answer that question because I think and and Senator, we can send you the full 
DEP emissions report that comes out every two years. Um, and I think uh, Melanie is probably the best one to give you the, the gory details. So Melanie, are you still out there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'll try not to geek out on you too much about this. I'm sorry. Um, so geeking is good. I, I used to sorry. run a data company in this area uh, measuring emissions uh, from corporations and it's a thorny business. I know that I'm curious. All right, well, so I'm gonna put this in terms that you probably will in particular understand that um, we are estimating emissions using uh, available data sources on things like energy consumption. So that's primarily the information from the EIA. Uh, we utilize a tool that's provided nationally to all states, which is called the State Inventory Tool that's produced by the Environmental Protection Agency. And they created that tool to line up with the same sectors that the EIA reports data in. So those pieces were designed to fit together. Um, we then also add in information that's reported to us by licensed air emission sources that have been reporting their greenhouse gas emissions to us since 2003, um, as well as other state specific data that we have that is better than what's been preloaded by EPA into the tool. So essentially what we're doing is we're looking at um, various activities and the um, rate at which carbon dioxide equivalents are emitted on an annual basis uh, based on use of emission factors associated with those activities for six different greenhouse gases. Uh, then we roll it all up into a total. So it's not, we're not doing stack testing. We're not measuring actual emissions. These are all just estimates based on a variety of factors and data inputs. And it, it's uh, comparative with, uh, comparable with what other states are doing in other jurisdictions so that, so that at least there's comparability even if there's inaccuracy. Yes, exactly. And that's actually one of the reasons that over the years we've suggested that um, we think it's useful to continue with this approach. Um, there are other approaches to estimating greenhouse gas emissions, but um, this one allows us to compare our numbers against all of the other states. And so if you looked at EPA's annual greenhouse gas emission inventory, their numbers will track very closely with ours for the main numbers, because we're all using the same data sets and the same tools. Um, and we also coordinate with some of the Canadian provinces um, to try to line up our inventory methods against theirs as well. Great. Well, I, I'd be happy to take this offline. I'd love to look at the details in your algorithms and whatnot. We would love to talk to you about okay. it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, and we will make sure I'll put in the link, um, or, or Melanie can put it in the chat, the, the link to the um, DEP emissions report. And again, Melanie, as well as Stacy Knapp, who does the report, are both excellent. And again, Senator Bennett, I'm sure they'll they'd be willing to again go into all the gory or nerdy details, however you want to phrase them. Um, so I'm just going to quick the, the the eight kind of buckets of strategies. The first three are about reducing our emissions in the transportation sector, the building sector, and the energy sector. Um, we have a we had a broad goal and focus on both clean energy jobs, but also jobs that are climate um, dependent or vulnerable and how we keep them um, sustainable and in, in some areas like forest products and agriculture help them grow. Um, and then the next three strategies about how do we preserve our natural working lands, um, uh, promote adaptation and resiliency in our communities um, and prepare our infrastructure for impacts we are already seeing from um, increasing weather events, um, erosion at the sea level, as well as, as, as other things like drought. Um, and last but not least, we had a lot of conversation and conversation, you know, with this committee as well about how do we make sure that main people are engaged in this work, that they both understand the plan, but also know um, in detail about programs um, for weatherization or, or heat pumps or understand um, the state's plan on, on climate action. So um, last goal is really about communication um, with main people. So Joyce Taylor is going to give you, um, again, the detail, but I would say uh, on transportation, the three main strategies are move towards electrification of, of Maine's um, transportation sector. Obviously, lots happening at the federal level and in other states, and, and there are certainly challenges in a large rural state to electrification. Um, but I think we're excited about the potential and have some bold goals about the transition to both plug-in hybrid vehicles, more efficient vehicles, and electric vehicles. 
Obviously, increasing fuel efficient and the use of alternative fuels also can contribute to reducing transportation emissions. And then the last is, is how do we help Maine people drive less, reducing vehicle miles traveled? Um, again, Joyce will talk about these strategies, but everything from um, expansion of broadband helps people work, go to school, um, have medical appointments from home. Um, next is how do we expand our public transportation infrastructure, which again requires creativity in a state um, that, is, that is largely rural. And then how do we better um, use our land use laws to make sure that people can, can actually live and go to school um, can, can drive less. So how can they, they work um, and, and go to school closer to their homes? So uh, a challenging of both housing and land use issues. Um, next, uh, modernizing main buildings. You'll hear from Michael Stoddard um, about the work of, of this committee, um, but obviously an important one. Everything from how do we transition to um, cleaner heating and cooling systems? How do we accelerate efficiency improvements in main buildings? Um, the report calls for doubling the rate of weatherization of main homes. Um, how do we advance the design and construction of new buildings? Making sure that they're more efficient and we don't need to be weatherizing those buildings in the future. We want to advance the design and promotion of climate friendly building products, something that we see as a, a incredibly important for um, reducing our emissions, but also fueling the wood product sector. So the use of CLT, wood fiber insulation, um, new energy efficiency technologies, um, again, important for um, the main economy, but also for reducing our emissions. And last, um, we had a strategy around leading by example in publicly funded buildings. So everything from the state level to um, how we help schools and municipalities um, become more efficient um, and, and reduce their emissions. Uh, Dan Burgess is gonna talk about the strategy to reduce carbon emissions in the energy sector, obviously an area where the state has already made progress and, and enacted significant legislation to make this happen. But we, we need to make sure that we do it in a way that is affordable, um, that really reaches across all parts of our large and rural state in a way that is manageable. Um, and as we trans, transform to a more, um, a state where we are heating and, and powering our transportation se sector with electricity, um, lots of important issues about our grid that we need to be careful um, to manage wisely. Um, we had some really good participation from the um, industrial sector, from our paper mills, McCain up in Northern Maine. Um, and I think there's important work to be done. There's already lots of work that's happened in Maine about um, reducing emissions from our industrial sector. Um, so this strategy calls for continuing partnerships to figure out how to reduce the emissions. Um, one of the opportunities, obviously highly efficient combined heat and power um, has been used in some of these facilities, also possible for some of Maine's large um, campuses, like we've seen universities, um, paper mills, uh, lumber mills go to combined um, heat and power opportunities. So this is just sort of the roadmap when we sat down to really figure out, all right, how do these strategies can be, contribute to reduce emissions? Um, we came up with this, this chart and it is aggressive and it's significant, but it is um, the really the pathway to reducing our emissions um, the amount um, passed in law by this past legislature, um, these are the things that we need to do. So um, this is again in the main climate action plan. Hopefully you all got a copy of it. It's also online, um, but this uh, obviously moving towards more and more um, electric vehicles on the road is significant and important to our strategy. Um, also can in I, building, yes. Can I interrupt you for just a second? Representative Dudera has a question. Thank you. Thanks very much. Just very quickly, um, Hannah, is that lead by example report that was is due by February 2021 for state government, is that available yet? I, I didn't see that. That is an excellent question, Representative, and it is almost February of 2021, so it is not available yet, but it's in the works, and we are happy to share it with all of you. I think the governor is, is, is weighing some of the details in that, and it calls for us to, to really make a roadmap to state government contributing in the same way we've asked everybody else in Maine. So uh, we look forward to bringing that back to you. So thank you for, for highlighting that. We're welcome, we welcome your suggestions as well. Um, so I, I won't go through the details on this because I think it will be um, brought up by some of the co-chairs, but obviously significant work in buildings, both 
um, weatherization, but also um, transitions to um, heat pumps. And heat pumps are a technology that is, is rapidly deploying in Maine, hundreds of people installing them across our state. Um, they are successfully heating many homes, including mine. And um, we know it's a way in which Maine people can both uh, save money, um, but also reduce their emissions. So uh, I, I've highlighted it, but I obviously I think for the governor um, and, and many people in the legislature, including this committee, really wanted um, us to highlight how we can grow Maine's economy while also tackling climate change, both in the clean energy and efficiency sector, um, but also in those climate climate vulnerable industries, whether it's fishing or forestry or farming. So the governor, as a part of this climate action plan, um, uh, set out a goal of doubling the number of clean energy jobs by 2030. There's uh, prior to the recession, there were about a little over 14,000 jobs in Maine. Um, and actually, as you can see from this chart, um, the the clean energy sector is the um, fastest growing sector of job growth in the country. Um, it's the, um, as you can see, it, it is growing at a rate of 10% while national employment growth um, is approximately 6%. Um, we have seen that growth in Maine. Um, Maine is currently lagging New England um, in clean energy growth through 2019. Um, but we think because of many of the actions and what we're seeing on the ground in Maine that we are certainly poised um, to, to be a leader um, and, and match the, the country's progress here. Um, so again, Amanda Beal will talk much more thoughtfully than I can about um, the strategy to both protect Maine's environment and working lands, but also promote natural climate solutions and carbon sequestration. Uh, Maine is a state that is 90% forested. Um, we, we certainly rely on our working forests for, for a huge part of our, our economic activity in Maine. So how we ensure that those lands stay working, um, how we ensure that they stay as um, carbon um, sequestration machines, very productive ones, um, is incredibly important. So a number of strategies to both um, better incentivize um, those activities, but also offer technical assistance to both farmers, to small woodlot owners, um, and you'll hear more about that from um, Commissioner Beal. Uh, obviously, um, a, a lot of the activity and, Senator, and Representative Bloom has really helped lead on this, um, but many of our communities across the state um, are really um, uh, considering how to better plan for resilience, how to manage infrastructure that's already being impacted. Um, so a lot of uh, focus in a couple of different committees around how do we provide better tools, support, um, as well as funding to municipalities and regions who um, need to do this work. Um, you will see in, in the Climate Action Plan a chart of the number of main communities who um, have, uh, have these um, technical assistance um, opportunities in-house, and it's really the vast minority. Most communities in Maine are seeking um, some kind of either funding or technical assistance for the state to do this work, and, and I think it's it's an area that, that Judy East will talk about, um, and I think there's, uh, you'll hear about a couple of different activities this upcoming session about how we as a state better support communities um, in preparing. Um, Clearly, as a part of this um, climate-ready infrastructure, um, we are already seeing um, you know, our infrastructure uh, be incredibly vulnerable, whether it's wastewater treatment plants or, or roadways, culverts um, that are not prepared for increasing rain events, not prepared for sea level rise. Um, so Joyce will talk about it as it relates to transportation infrastructure. Um, there was a proposal in the Climate Action Plan to establish a state infrastructure adaptation fund. Um, we now, just even the last couple months at the end of the Trump administration, certainly lots of activity in the, in the Biden administration around increased support from FEMA um, to match um, state funding for adaptation projects. The, the West Brook, Brook Bank that caved in, for example, is a good example of the types of projects that, that Maine um, needs to invest in and, and could leverage significant federal dollars with some state match. Um, so last but not least, obviously the engagement of Maine people um, in these issues, um, both how to prepare in their communities, opportunities they can take to, to weatherize and make their homes or businesses more efficient, um, and, and lots of engagement from young people who are interested in, in being a part of this work. So 
I won't go into the detail. We can, we can, you'll hear about it um, throughout the day, but uh, obviously this committee, I think is probably most interested in what are we gonna do now? You've, you've delivered us a, the plan. We're gonna hear more about the plan throughout this morning, um, but what's coming this legislative session to start taking action. Um, so in the area of energy, Dan Burgess will, will, can, can touch on it, but um, clearly the governor is committed to continuing to take action to um, incur, encourage larger energy procurements and adjust solar programs um, to take advantage of, of low cost energy as well as job creation in this area. Uh, transportation, um, clearly highly ambitious goals um, and many states we've seen around the country have really kicked off this work. Um, with more detailed roadmaps, everything from where do the charging stations need to be to um, how can state and local governments procure um, uh, more efficient vehicles. Um, so the governor is um, going to sign an executive order in the, in the next, I would say, month around a clean transportation roadmap process and plan. So something that would come back to, to you and the transportation committee um, to really see the details of, of how we'll make this happen. Um, I'll let Amanda Beal talk about um, the uh, state forest carbon program task force that the governor just signed an executive order last week that task force has its first meeting planned um, but really trying to kick off the work to work with um, medium um, small and medium-sized woodlot owners around um, in encouraging forest management practices that sequester more carbon uh, Melanie um, and the DEP is leading um, on a specific sea level rise resolve um, that will be coming to this committee and I, I can let her speak to that. Um, uh, Representative Dudera mentioned the lead by example plan coming next month. Uh, Representative Tucker has got uh, bringing back the HFC phase down bill which passed this committee unanimously last legislative session. Um, we have seen action um, in Congress around a similar bipartisan effort that did pass um, at the end of the last um, at, at the last Congress. Um, so obviously significant action to phase down these super pollutants um, for greenhouse gases. Um, and, and last but not least, there's there are actually hundreds of bills in the main legislature dealing with climate. The governor has specifically um, suggested her support for appliance standards as well as financing for businesses who are trying to install uh, renewable energy. Um, so we will continue to support those and we, we definitely look forward to engaging with many other bills that are, that are on the horizon. Um, I will say that another area of how do we actually implement this plan. Um, I, in the coming weeks, the governor um, is gonna announce a, a bond proposal, which she is talking to members on both sides of the aisle about, um, but she did announce in her her speech on December 1 when we released the Climate Action Plan, specific support for uh, municipal infrastructure, doubling the pace of weatherization, um, other ways to um, invest in state and local infrastructure, whether it be transportation, broadband, um, wastewater and drinking water, um, or heritage industry processing, you know, primarily forestry, uh, farming, um, and agriculture. Um, and I would say all this work is only going to be possible with continued workforce training, especially in the clean energy area. There's a desperate need for electricians, for example. So really active work happening right now with CTEs and community colleges around how do we increase the number of people ready to go into these trades that are looking for workers. Um, and last but not least, investment in our working in natural lands and state parks. Um, so the only other thing I will say is clearly, uh, you know, we, we've had legislators say, how are you gonna pay for all of this? We've talked a little bit about some of the opportunities. Um, there are current programs in state government, whether it's with Efficiency Maine, um, DMR, uh, uh, Maine Housing, DOT, that are already making in investments um, that, that I think are, are, are helpful and are really getting us started on the right path. Um, Michael Stoddard, through Efficiency Maine, um, is administering both BW and soon to be NCEC dollars to invest in charging infrastructure, heat pump installation, um, as well as electric vehicle rebates. Um, but the plan will require over time significant and sustained investments from a variety of sources. I will say that um, there has been at the, at the end of the last Congress and certainly in this new incoming Congress, significant federal activity and likely action on climate. Um, we, we are happy to keep this committee posted, I think we are following it closely as it evolves. Um, 
But the at the, again, at the end of the last Congress, um, a significant energy bill passed that um, re-up tax credits for renewable energy and offshore wind, um, additional funding for state energy programs. Um, again, there's a new FEMA program that specifically targets um, uh, climate adaptation infrastructure projects. Um, uh, President Biden just announced yesterday a new executive action um, on federal fleet purchases, looking to both buy American cars but purchase 100% EVs for the state for the for the federal fleet. Um, so Maine is certainly looking at how they did that and and what they are doing. Um, so again, I, I will say there there's lots more um, that we're happy to continue to stay engaged with this committee on. Um, there's certainly activity in Congress happening. Um, in a fast and furious manner, um, but I do think a lot of it will complement how do we implement this plan thoughtfully, um, you know, certainly maximizing potential federal programs and dollars. Um, so with that, uh, Melanie and I are happy to answer questions. Again, know that behind us come some of the uh, working group chairs who are really the experts, but I think there's, there's um, a lot um, that is in this plan. It is a four-year plan, so it's not all going to happen this year. Um, I will just say, uh, you know, clearly this work was done during both a recession and a pandemic. Um, you know, we're grateful for the many people who engaged um, it, during a very difficult time. Um, and I, I think we are proud of the work. The governor really helped us name this report, Maine Won't Wait, because we, we can't wait, we need to start taking action. Um, but clearly um, there are constraints and there are, there are you know, I think this, this is still a, a measured plan of how we take action over the next four years. So um, with that, again, Melanie and I are happy to answer a couple questions and then we will pass it off to um, Ivan Fernandez and Bob Marvini, um, the co-chairs of the Science and Technical Subcommittee. Thank you so much, Hannah and Melanie. Uh, it's an impressive bit of work that you've done. And um, there's a question from Senator Bennett. Hi, thanks. Yeah, so uh, this, it's it's an amazing plan. I just got it and I was flipping through it uh, last day. Um, there's a lot to it. The question I have is, you know, um, the 80-20 rule, right? Um, 80% of what we do is gonna be governed by 20% of our activities. What is the most impactful part of these, all these strategies? You've thrown the kitchen sink in it, but what, what are the top three things that we need to do and that the administration is focused on to achieve the goals of reduced uh, emissions? What, you know, and, 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 what are, and can we, how do we focus on those? What are they first? Melanie, we, we want, Melanie and I can each give our answers and you can see if they're the same. Um, Melanie, you wanna start? Oh good, I was hoping you were gonna let me go first. Your answer will be more comprehensive. Um, I, you know, I would say short version is electrification of the transportation sector and switching off of fossil fuel based fuels to other fuel types uh, because that also reduces the um, carbon released through combustion um, followed by uh, home heating, building heating, you know, those areas where we're seeing a significant amount of emissions associated with energy consumption just for space heating. So that's things like the heat pump strategy, for example. Now, Hannah, you take a stab at it. No, I mean, Melanie gave a great answer. I mean, I would say that the, the legislature already passed a, a, a significant piece of legislation to make our electricity sector um, very clean and, uh, you know, 80% uh, renewable by, by 2030, which is both good for the economy, but allows the electrification of heating and transportation uh, to move forward. I would say um, heating technology is already here and it's already happening. And you'll hear that from Michael Stoddard. Transportation is emerging and evolving. Um, I know there are several thousand people in Maine who have electric cars. Um, but we're a long ways to go from 2025 and 2030 goals. So I think, you know, we certainly hear from Detroit that there are many models coming and it's something that I think a lot of Mainers, um, they need to see the uh, four wheel drive electric car, they need to see um, affordability and 
um, range, but um, obviously that is probably the most significant part of our work in the coming years to both plan for this transition, um, make it accessible to Mainers, um, you know, moderate and low income as well, um, and, and obviously to plan the infrastructure to make it all happen. I will only just say the, the other two areas, I think helping communities plan, I think communities are coming to the state and saying, you know, we need support for, for infrastructure that is incredibly vulnerable. We need some technical support to do this work. Um, that's not an easy area to attack. I think it will take a couple years for this legislature and state to really think about how to do it in an incentive-based way. I think we're not looking for, you know, a ton of new rules. We're looking for ways to help communities to work together and to support them in this work. Um, I will just say also um, the, the last area is Maine's forests are, you know, they are, they are the key to carbon neutrality. Maine, you know, as well as a couple other states around the country are already sequestering an incredible amount of carbon. That's those same forests are fueling a huge part of our economy. So I think to get it right in terms of the incentives to preserve those forests and keep them working to keep them economic engines, but sequestration engines, I'd say that's kind of the third bucket of, of really important work. Again, Amanda Beal, I'm sure we'll hit on it, but I, I think that's a big one. If I could just ask a quick follow up, uh, just taking the first two that you both agree on, um, the electrification of transportation and the building efficiency and heating technology, do we have specific uh, goals within the four years to accomplish certain outcomes in those areas that, that then translate, we know will translate to X amount of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and are, maybe they're in the plan. I haven't been able to read it that deep, but that would be of great interest to me if you have such. Yes, and I'm just going back to the chart. Um, it is in the plan and I will just quickly screen share it again. Um, so, I'd say that this chart is the most important one. I mean, we spent some time turning the, the dials on this one and, you know, basically we worked with uh, a company called Synapse, a modeling company in Boston. And they, they uh, you know, this is how you, this is how the majority of our emission reductions are in this transportation and building sector. And these are the things you need to do. And if we don't do them, we have to find the, saving somewhere else. And I think they are, they're not small goals. Um, I would say again, um, in the heat pump sector, we are, we are already moving in this direction. In transportation, it, it is a heavy lift and we will need new technology. Um, we will need automakers um, and likely federal support to, to make these things happen. So um, mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the detailed chart. There's more modeling we're happy to share. It's on our website as well. Um, climatecouncil.maine.gov, um, the gory, gory details of the modeling report. Um, so again, ha happy to share any of this, but this is really the roadmap. Thank you. And Representative Dudera. Thank you. Um, our town had a special town meeting on Monday night, which was uh, pretty interesting. We met at the Snow Bowl in our cars and voted out our car windows. Um, to approve a large package to improve a number of public municipal buildings and also to make them uh, more resistant and more um, energy efficient. Um, that passed along with a little poll about uh, endorsing the Climate Council goals. So that was the good news. Uh, the bad news was that the town manager uh, said she did not feel that the state was giving towns enough support to become more resilient. So I'm glad to hear that um, you know, we're gonna be addressing that and thinking about that. I think we have to really make a push as legislatures to really uh, work with our towns to make them see how the state can help them accomplish these goals. I just say Representative Dudair, that's, that's good news from your town. I mean, I think the reality is that there are ways to take action, but also ways these same things save towns money, obviously. Efficiency in buildings uh, and schools is is a, is certainly a taxpayer saving. So obviously, uh, again, Michael Stoddard can can sort of help highlight ways in which we can do this. But everything from efficiency to renewable energy to to planning 
is clearly an area where we have a lot, a long ways to go with towns. Um, we are working on a pilot program um, to really pilot some resiliency technical tools um, with communities in Maine. Um, we look forward to bringing those results back to this legislature. But again, it, it, is, it is about people and it is about, you know, certainly money for infrastructure. And, you know, that is the challenging time to ask the state for that. So we will look forward to working with all of you on, on how to make that happen. All right. Do we feel ready to move on to our scientific and technical subcommittee? Oh, Representative Hanley has one more one more question before we move on. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Your report, um, it, it, it says that in uh, 10 years, nine years actually, 85% of the sales of vehicles, uh, light vehicles, will that be 80, how much of the actual vehicles on the road will be electric at that time? What's your, what's your goal? That is a good, so by 2030, um, just looking back at this chart, by 2030, it, the goal is 219,000 vehicles um, would be EVs. Um, I will say plug-in hybrids also, there are equivalents. So, um, you know, not a small number. I, I forgot off the top of my head how many vehicles there are in main total. Um, I know that Dan Burgess <clears throat> or Michael Stoddard behind me or Joyce could answer that question. But again, Representative Hanley, it's, thank you for pointing it out. It, it's ambitious. We're not going to require, I mean, some states like California currently have, have phased out the sale of fossil fuel vehicles. Um, I think California is 2035. So Maine, we are looking to incentivize um, more and more vehicles on the road in 2025 and 2030. I have a follow-up, if I may. The, uh, yes, please. Yes, has anyone, have you calculated at all what kind of um, capacity increase you're going to have on the grid? What kind of load? I mean, when you consider you're going to have a, uh, you know, a huge portion of the state of Maine is coming home from work all at the same time and plugging their cars and turning the heat pumps on, turning on the uh, electronic instruments in their homes. What kind of load you're going to put on the grid and where you're going to get that power from? And, you know, is the grid capable of handling such massive uh, increases? And now Represent I'm sorry. No, Representative Hanley, I know as a former, uh, you know, lead on the uh, EUT committee, uh, you know these issues well. And I would say that, again, actually Dan Burgess and Michael Stoddard behind me can, can better answer that, but that was part of the deliberations of the energy working group. Um, you know, we know that the size of the grid will need to increase, the amount of electricity pr produced will need to increase for this kind of electrification, and that will require uh, upgrades, it will require you know, innovation and, and some of that modeling work was done as a part of this process. And I would say the energy working group um, called for some significant additional, uh, I think they call it power sector transformation work um, because this is uh, obviously incredibly important to get it right and to get it right in a way that's also affordable. So um, I think that's an excellent question and a question that will need to be kind of important driving force of making this happen in a way that's affordable for Maine people. Um, I'd like to, uh, to recognize Representative O'Connor next, but then perhaps if you have nitty gritty question questions, we could hold them until we start to move into the conversation about the um, science and technology behind the report, if that's okay with everyone. Representative O'Connor. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, when listening, I'm piggybacking on Representative Hanley's question. Um, a few years ago, I also served on the Energy Committee, and I had some great concerns because, um, as you all know, we are part of the ISO New England grid, and the conversations that we had, um, and actually Michael Stoddard was a part of that, we are going to need in the very near future to power the ISO New England grid about another 8,000 megawatts of energy. Um, we're 
seriously lacking as of now. And I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, and we can do this um, at another time, but I'd really like to see the plan on how we're going to get that energy because I do have the great concerns. I see the huge expanse of solar. I see this huge expanse of wind power. And I do know that those um, powers are intermittent and non-dispatchable power sources, which, um, you know, I oftentimes are not, will not be adequate to power when we think about that electrification. And so, you know, I, I'd really like to know how we're gonna get there from, from here. And before we make all the investments in the future, I think that we should know that we will have the amount of power necessary to reach the goals that we're looking for. And I can take an answer at any other time or somebody can give me the information at any other time. And please excuse me, I have a painter working behind me right now, sorry. <laughs> No, no, a good question. It's a very good question, Representative O'Connor. And I, I really, you. if he's not, if he's not on, I'm going to text Dan Burgess to make sure that that he helps to answer that. But I would say that it's an important question and a question that the Energy Committee is grappling with. Clearly, we need uh, energy storage. We need um, power that is not intermittent to make this all work. We need time of use. Um, management as well, uh, something that Michael Stoddard and Efficiency Maine have been piloting in different ways. So I'm going to ask both of them to better answer your question, but just know that it is a good one and it's one that we're focused on. I know the governor is focused on ISO um, working as a region to answer those kind of questions, but also making sure it's a good deal for Maine and, and the governor has been pushing on that. So um, happy to keep talking about it with the, I love the former EUT members of ENR. So um, again, uh, I'll let Michael and, and Dan give a better answer to that. Representative Tool, do you have a large picture question or something dealing with the nitty gritty? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess my large picture question is the other day, the governor announced support for a moratorium on offshore wind. And I guess the large picture question of that is how does that figure into all of this and how does that a puzzle? Representative Tool, very good question. I'll pass that one again off to my colleague, Dan Burgess. Um, I will say the governor's um, uh, proposed moratorium on offshore wind uh, is specifically targeted towards offshore wind in state waters, you know, where 80% of our lobstermen are fishing. Um, she is still focused on opportunities, especially humane technology for um, uh, floating offshore wind in federal waters. And we are engaged actively in a federal process around citing that and, and making that happen. Um, we certainly see uh, offshore wind as a uh, huge opportunity for energy production in Maine, but also an economic opportunity that will create good paying jobs. Um, clearly we need to do it in a way that's thoughtful and well cited and, and works with our fishing communities. And I do think um, there were some rumors obviously in your area around some in, inshore offshore wind projects that, that we did not feel um, sort of fit the, the plan in which the governor was trying to promote. So I, I think that hopefully that moratorium will, will help uh, make it clear where we don't want wind. Um, and I will just say she really is still very bullish on wind in, in federal waters. And we're happy to keep talking to you and other coastal reps about how to do that in a responsible way. Thank you for all the great questions, committee members. Um, and I think we're ready to move on to Mr. Fernandez and Mr. Marvini. Great, uh, I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Was I successful? Okay. Yes. Well, great, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, uh, senators and representatives. It's an honor to to uh, be here to talk about some of the work that we did, um, as well as to be here with uh, uh, my colleagues and uh, dedicated coworkers in this effort to, uh, to address climate change. Um, uh, I'm Ivan Fernandez, my co-chair uh, for the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee is uh, Bob, Bob Marvini, who will be speaking shortly uh, in a few minutes and Dr. Cassandra Rose from the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future was a, the staff scientist that uh, have, is uh, and has worked with us in this process. Uh, the legislative responsibilities for the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee 
were uh, delineated as threefold. This is a uh, sh shortened version of the, uh, of the text, but first and foremost, the core uh, task was to provide the latest scientific assessment uh, of the direct and indirect effects of climate change uh, in Maine, uh, with particular call outs for the importance of projections of uh, sea level rise to 2100, maps of uh, vulnerable areas in the state to extreme events and, and climate related uh, risks, uh, and to identify uh, critical information needs. Uh, also was the call out to uh, identify options for quantifying carbon emissions and sequestration uh, and to uh, identify methods uh, to build resilience and adaptation. Uh, and uh, these areas of work certainly were in concert with uh, a lot of the work you'll hear about uh, that took place in the uh, working committees. Um, the uh, scientific and technical subcommittee uh, consisted of 28 members. Um, they were scientists with uh, international uh, reputations um, and extensive Maine experience. Most lived in Maine. A couple lived just across the border in New Hampshire with extensive uh, work in Maine. Uh, and all of them extremely dedicated to, uh, to do the work that identifies the climate change impacts that are taking place in Maine. Uh, that should drive the science-informed policy that uh, was being developed. Uh, our, the work of the subcommittee uh, was as a, a committee meeting monthly uh, and working on the tasks of the primarily the major assessment, uh, as well as some members uh, working in various uh, working groups, uh, as well as with uh, state agencies and engaged in the process. We developed a, what we called a working document um, that we delivered to the council in January of 2020. Um, recall that the, uh, the um, council was established technically in, in September, uh, just a few months uh, before that. So this was a, a relatively rapid uh, effort to pull together the best known information uh, at the time uh, to get it in front of the working groups as they uh, began their uh, deliberations in earnest through last winter and summer. Um, the, the final assessment was delivered in uh, August 2020. Um, with uh, factoids around it being, it's a very significant document, 370 pages. Um, uh, Commissioner Loisem already uh, showed you the cover page and the, and the link where you can download it. Uh, the, it was led by, of course, the, the, the STS of our 28 members. There were um, uh, 37 co-authors uh, all together with uh, invited other scientists that participated and then 57 people on uh, that also provided important input that we recognized in our acknowledgements, all of which is to say about 100 people uh, worked and uh, contributed to this effort. Uh, you've seen the cover be, uh, before, that's uh, artwork from a, a scientist out of the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine. Um, and this is a, the table of contents of the report um, shown here just to give you a, a quick glimpse of the kinds of categories of information that were dealt with uh, in, in depth. Of course, the climate system itself, um, marine systems, forests, oceans, uh, farms, uh, human health, uh, and then a, a chapter on Maine's economy as well as uh, a chapter uh, addressing uh, priority information needs. Uh, overall, the key deliverables that came from our, our assessment uh, was uh, as requested and uh, as is critical for our process, a summary of climate change impacts uh, in the state of Maine. And uh, this is, uh, these are uh, focused on Maine. We hear a lot in the news about um, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessments and National Climate Assessments, but uh, for, for the best policy, the most cost-effective policy in the state, we need to know what's happening in our backyard, and that was, that was our focus. Uh, we included sea level rise projections to 2100, uh, we, an initial estimate of the carbon budget, uh, identification of the priority information needs as, uh, as charged, uh, and the identification of methods uh, to build uh, resilience to, uh, to climate change. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about a, a, a couple of those findings or the highlights of a couple of those findings. Uh, and then uh, Bob will uh, continue with that uh, description. Uh, to no one's surprise, uh, Maine is warming. Over the last uh, 125 years, we've warmed about uh, 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 
winters are warming faster than any other season. Uh, minimum, temp minimum temperatures are warming faster than maximum temperatures. Uh, the coastal uh, climate division in the state is warming slightly faster than uh, the central and the interior divisions. Uh, and of course, uh, the last six warmest years on the planet uh, were the last six years. Uh, and so the escalation of the warming continues. We included projections in our uh, analysis. Um, using the uh, best models from an ensemble from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to uh, predict the future uh, of warming that would take place under uh, different scenarios of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, and what you see in this figure is uh, the historical data uh, and then the three different plots into the future, uh, depending on whether we follow low, medium, or uh, high greenhouse gas emission uh, trajectories. Um, and what we see is between now and uh, 2050, uh, we will continue to warm between one and four degrees Fahrenheit uh, and up to 10 degrees by uh, 2100. And the path that we take uh, is strongly dependent on what we do now re regarding uh, greenhouse gas emissions as a function of uh, burning fossil fuels uh, and land use. Uh, other aspects that were touched on in the, in the report, uh, here are some of the uh, human and animal health risks. Um, the maps here just are, are showing the expansion of uh, tick habitat in Maine uh, and projections into the future. And so the, the process we've been experiencing will continue. Um, Lyme disease and other vector-borne diseases uh, have uh, increased. Uh, we know 2019 was a record year for Lyme disease and uh, just in the last 24 hours, you may have seen news reports that CDC uh, is reporting that um, the actual cases are probably uh, up to 10 times more than what uh, are reported. Uh, he extreme heat days and heat related illnesses uh, increase. Drought and wildfire has effects on water quality and respiratory health. And we've seen both of those uh, in play this year. Uh, extreme weather risks uh, are, are increasing to both humans and animals. Uh, bacterial infections uh, such as uh, Vibrio in marine systems and uh, HABs, uh, so-called HABs, harmful algal blooms in Maine lakes, of which uh, this year was a particularly uh, challenging one. Uh, pollen uh, is increasing in its effects on human allergies because the pollen season is lengthening and allergenicity of pollen uh, is increasing. Uh, and all of this also contributes to uh, mental health uh, for us, and certainly in the year of a pandemic, uh, we all understand the, uh, the importance of those challenges. Um, this is a, a, just a piece of uh, an, a, an initial assessment that we did, a group of us based out of the, uh, the university, but several of us are on the uh, Scientific and te Technical Subcommittee, uh, an initial estimate of Maine's carbon budget, uh, per, perhaps uh, also known as Maine's carbon cycle, all of the major pools and fluxes. Uh, this image focuses on uh, the terrestrial component uh, and the data on the left here shows the highlight. You, we've already uh, heard uh, that uh, Maine uh, occupies nearly 90% uh, of the landscape um, is in forest. Uh, and so forests are an incredibly important part of uh, Maine's carbon budget uh, and our economy and our lives. Um, the assessment here showed that uh, forests are growing faster than we're harvesting them right now. So that means we're accumulating carbon on the landscape. Uh, and if we compare that accumulation of carbon uh, in equivalent units to the uh, greenhouse gas, the reported greenhouse gas emissions uh, that Commissioner Lozum uh, referred to, uh, the, the forests are offsetting, uh, not in a legal way, but in a, a, a scientific way, uh, about 60% of those greenhouse gas emissions. If we add to that durable products, not something that uh, is going to be back in the atmosphere quickly, but uh, such as uh, dimension lumber the, in buildings, uh, that adds another 15%. So about 75% of the current greenhouse gas emissions are being offset uh, by uh, our forests and our, our forest economy. And then finally, um, Maine's economy uh, chapter pointed to uh, a, a few different areas. Um, the uh, uh, dis divergence of uh, gross domestic product and greenhouse gas emissions. You've already 
uh, heard about. Greenhouse gas emissions are, are, have gone down in Maine, um, at, while uh, GDP has not. Um, uh, the chapter also highlighted um, some of the uh, natural climate solutions options, um, both from a carbon as well as an economic uh, standpoint that uh, has been important for the discussions in, in the working groups and ongoing uh, for the discussions of the uh, carbon task force the governor just, uh, just established. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn into projectionist and turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Marvini. Thank you, Ivan, and uh, thank you, members of the committee, for this opportunity. I'm Bob Marvini. I'm the state geologist in the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, and I'm going to look at the marine environment and uh, changes uh, relative to climate change. So we'll start first with ocean temperature. As we've seen the, the climate, uh, you know, uh, over the state of Maine, temperatures increase so have the temperatures in the Gulf of Maine. Two graphs, one, uh, one from the overall Gulf of Maine showing increasing uh, ocean temperatures and the blue from Booth Bay Harbor. And I think the important thing is to see that it's an upward trend and that the rate is increasing and we expect it to increase through at least 2050. Next. And if we look at projections beyond 2050, of course, they would be tied to emissions scenarios. And under a low emissions scenario, the blue line and the, the blue uh, shaded area, the, uh, the temperature of the ocean would stabilize about one and a half degrees C above where it is right now in about, at about 2050. And under the high emissions scenario, the temperatures continue to rise through the end of the century, maybe three degrees C. Thank you, next. Looking at ocean acidification. So uh, we've been looking at ocean acidification for centuries here. And globally, the uh, pH has decreased to just a 10th of a point. Doesn't sound like much, but if you're an organism living in the marine environment, that can have a, a significant impact. And again, the, uh, the degree of future acidification will depend on the emissions scenarios. Of course, the main source for this acidification is CO2 in the atmosphere being incorporated into the waters of the ocean. So uh, depending on, on the, which scenario is uh, followed in terms of emissions, the ocean uh, uh, acidity may stabilize or it may continue to decrease. And that would be a particular problem for organisms that build shells from calcium carbonate. Next. We look at the marine ecosystems. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, uh, these diagrams of biomass in the, along the Eastern seaboard and into the Gulf of Maine. This is based on uh, lobster trawling by NOAA. So it, it's uh, directly connected to our most significant fishery. And it's mostly driven by ocean warming, although there are other, other factors um, that also uh, impact this change, but um, mostly driven by ocean warming. We still don't know though, we need to do more work to understand how the how the uh, marine ecosystem responds to the interactive uh, effects of, of uh, the, the coastal ecosystem of ocean acidification, ocean warming, and sea level rise. So there's still a fair amount of, uh, of work here, but clearly we have seen the increase in lobsters uh, in, in the Gulf of Maine over the last decades. Next, please. Okay, I'll turn to sea level rise now, which is one of the uh, developing a projection for sea level rise for 2100 it is one of the key uh, charges to the science and technical subcommittee. So sea level rise is driven by a number of factors, but you can see circled there in red, the two that drive it most 50% from melting of land-based ice, not floating ice shelves, but land-based ice uh, that, in, 
that contributes 50% to the uh, measured sea level rise and 40% is from thermal expansion. Heat up the water, it takes more space. So, and then all the other factors like shifts in the landscape from geology, uh, water storage on the land, ocean circulation, et cetera, is only 10%. So we'll go to the next slide and we'll focus on the two most important uh, factors. Is it advancing? Uh, there we go. So just looking at thermal expansion and added water from melting of ice, um, these are independent measurements uh, taken over the last several decades, uh, the red line for thermal expansion of the ocean and the blue line for uh, volume, volume of water added by looking at the volumes of uh, loss in melting on land glaciers. And the black line is the observed sea level uh, measured by uh, very accurate satellites since, uh, since 1993. And the purple line is adding that thermal, measured thermal expansion and measured uh, added water. And you can see that it very clearly matches the observed changes in uh, ocean sea level. So these are the driving factors to sea level rise. Next. So if we look closer to home, we've had a tight gauge in, in Portland for uh, over 100 years. And here's a summary diagram of annual water levels uh, at Portland. We can go back in the geologic record and look back at the last 5,000 years and estimate that sea level rose at about three, three and a half inches a century. Uh, for the period of the Portland tide gauge, the sea level has been rising at about 7.4 inches per century. And in the last, uh, 25 years, it's been rising at almost at, at a little over a foot per century. So these are direct measurements from a tide gauge. Next, please. Just a, one a consequence of this sea level rise is what we refer to as nuisance flooding. There are a lot of periods at, at, at particular high tide cycles of the year that um, without any storms, with clear weather, we still experience this coastal flooding. So here's an example from Portland where the, the flood stage is 12 feet and um, the chart shows how many hours in a year that flood stage was exceeded. And you can visualize very easily just with your eye that it's the, the frequency is increasing. If we look at the average over the 100 plus years of that gauge, um, it's only three and a half hours per year. That's that black line. But in the last decade, it's been over almost 12 hours per year. And that's that uh, the red line. So this is a direct consequence of sea level rise on our coastal communities. Next, please. If we just take that same chart and add one level of sea level rise, then the frequency increases dramatically, uh, 54 times per year that Portland would face flooding with one, uh, one foot of sea level rise. And that's over that entire period. If we look at just the last, 20, uh, the last decade, that would be 130 hours where the uh, low lying areas would be flooded. So that's that's, uh, and that's only one foot of sea level rise. Next, please. So here's the, here's the key thing, you know, projections. What are the reasonable projections uh, for sea level rise on the coast of Maine? And here's the example using Portland data. The blue line is the tide gauge data. And then the colored line, dashed lines are, um, the expected range of sea level rise under various emissions scenarios. And we're focusing on the red one that uh, would generate almost four feet of sea level rise by the year 2100. And the brackets are the, uh, are the uh, 
uh, variability uh, low low to high around that uh, that middle estimate of 3.9 uh, feet by 2100. And these data are generated through the Army Corps of Engineers and from NOAA reports and the sea level rise uh, uh, section of our report was uh, generated by the three most probably most experienced marine geologists in the state of Maine and then reviewed by all the members of our committee. So and we we can visualize this on a on our the Maine Geological Survey website. We have a, a portal that allows you to surf along the coast of Maine and look at um, add add the impacts of sea level rise in various scenarios and just look at what areas get flooded. And this is without storm surge and without waves. This is just static sea level rise increases in the areas that will be flooded. So moving next. So our, our recommendation that's in the uh, Climate Action Plan is to commit to manage for a range of sea level rise that um, is associated with the intermediate scenario, that red line on the prior diagram. Um, and it, under that scenario, we may see one to almost two feet of sea level rise by 2050 and potentially three to four and a half by 2100. We should also prepare to manage for likely higher levels of sea from possibly 2.6 to 3 feet by 2050 and potentially almost 8 to 9 feet by 2100. So those are the recommendations from the Science and Technical Subcommittee to the Maine Climate Council. Next, please. And finally, I'll close just with a, a brief overview of, of priorities for research uh, generated that, that this committee generated. So there's a number of cross-cutting priorities, historical and predicted climatology. Let's improve that for our region. Um, look more deeply at the effects on humans and ecosystems. Life cycle and benefit, benefit cost assessments. We really need to look a little bit more deeply at the, the economic uh, side of, of climate change. And as Ivan noted, um, uh, really work a bit more on, on Maine's climate uh, uh, carbon cycle. And then there's some targeted priorities around uh, coastal and riverine flooding. We really, um, we know that flooding will be, uh, particularly on the rivers, will be a continuing issue. But we don't have good approaches to modeling that at this time. Forest bioproducts are important um, and farm and food systems are also very important. And we got to look more at those vulnerabilities. And then there are a number of monitoring priorities around uh, on land systems and the marine systems. So I think with that, um, I, I think I'll finish. Thank you very much. And Ivan and I will be happy to respond to questions. Thank you both so much. Um, Representative Tucker has a question. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask a question of the scientific and technical aspects or, or, or of this. You showed us a lot of charts and projections, um, both Ivan and uh, uh, Dr. Marvini. When you go to conferences or you read periodicals in your areas of specialty, I'd like to know if, the types of charts and projections you showed us are a mainline consensus about what's going on within the, science, within the scientific community or whether this is just one view among many. Uh, are, are there other scientists who would take issue with all the charts and projections? Um, or are these pretty much mainline accepted scientific uh, observations? Sure, I'll, I'll respond, uh, Representative Tucker, on, on our sea level rise projections. So um, 
Yeah, it's always, it's always, you know, we can look back and, and we can see all this wonderful data and we know where we've been. And it always gets a little fuzzier when we're looking out to the future and trying to predict something. But um, I can say this, that over the decades, these um, projections for sea level rise generated by many sources, uh, federal government sources, um, uh, university uh, researchers, et cetera, have um, really, um, really become more focused and, 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 and better tuned to match what we've seen in current sea level rise and, um, and, to, uh, and, and the, the key thing that I've seen is that every new projection over the decades really um, increases the levels that we're likely to see under these um, uh, emission scenarios. I have not seen any that suggest that, um, that a new modeling approach produces an out output that has lower sea level projections. They're all focused on higher sea level and over the years they've gotten higher and higher as we've understood how to bring in important contributing factors. So this is really, you know, is it a consensus? It's hard to say it's a consensus, but it's certainly a, uh, a uh, melding of many sources and many disciplines to generate these projections. Yeah, I would just add, Representative Tucker, that uh, that goes for uh, certainly uh, warming uh, trends and, and uh, melting ice. Uh, when you go to scientific uh, meetings, the discussions are around uh, improving the uh, estimate of the variability around the projections um, and refinements uh, of the projections, particularly when we're talking about modeling of the future. Um, but the, the, and there are surveys out there, I'm sure many of the members of the committee have seen these that, uh, you know, 97% of the scientists uh, concur. And that's the experience that uh, I, I, I certainly have had at scientific meetings. It's not about uh, whether it's left or right or up or down. It's about uh, fine tuning the projections going forward and better understanding um, sort of the uncertainty around human behavior in influencing uh, the biophysical world uh, with uh, concurrence that uh, these trends are continuing. Most of the new science that seems to come out uh, that at least captures headlines uh, ends up saying that uh, what we did before underestimated the rate of change uh, and that many of these sea level rise, warming, melting ice, uh, the rates of change are, are accelerating uh, as we go forward in time. Yes, Representative O'Connor. And Mr. Fernandez, can you perhaps turn off your screen share so that we might be able to see all of our committee members? Oh yeah, sure, sorry. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Representative O'Connor. Yes, th thank you, Mr. Marvini, um, for that was actually very interesting. My question is, um, I understand the importance of this. Um, however, I still, I look to what we're doing here in Maine, um, the good work that we're doing to try to protect, pro, pro, you know, to protect our environment, the other environments in, you know, the United States and around. Um, but I wonder if we are um, investing heavily in this as we are, how the effects of countries like China and India, who seem to be just willy nilly in their effects, you know, and, and how they address this, I wonder how much, um, we can really change the trajectory of this. And that being said, the other question that piggybacks on this is, um, wouldn't it be more prudent for us instead of trying to, at this point in time, electrify the state of Maine and make all of these very large investments for the future, wouldn't it be more prudent for us to work with local planning boards um, to understand when um, these, these sea levels, which will regardless of what we do will rise, I, I believe that it would be more prudent to invest in the infrastructures, specifically things that really um, I look at are water and sewer, 
for the communities that are coastal. So um, I, I would love to see an answer to that if I could get that in the future, more information, because sometimes I, I wonder if everybody else isn't in the same boat, then, um, then what we do won't amount to a hill of beans. And thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly respond and say, yeah, um, if it's just Maine acting, there, there will be probably pretty small consequence in terms of sea level rise. But, and it certainly is a global issue, but I don't think that Maine is the only uh, jurisdiction that's trying to respond to this. And certainly I absolutely agree, we need to help the local, uh, local coastal communities and other communities because we already have to adapt. Sea levels can arise even if we stop completely uh, CO2 emissions right now, uh, sea level will continue to rise because of the momentum in the system. So we need to respond. We need, communities need resources to adapt because they have to, it's already impacting them and will continue to impact them for the foreseeable future. Could I just, just add to that a great question and obviously a challenge uh, of, of scale, uh, but it's a challenge that uh, all jurisdictions around the planet uh, need to engage in in order to solve it. And so we're, we're not an exception. Um, when we burn fossil fuels, there's also co-pollutants, which are local. Um, like particulate matter and, and nitrous oxide. Uh, and so we benefit directly by not burning fossil fuels to, uh, to drive our economy relative to, to, to local air quality. Uh, and we've seen this before with acid rain uh, over the last 30 years, um, same kinds of concerns. We didn't produce that much, uh, downwind produced most of it. So why should we bother? Um, but we, we all uh, did it together and we found out it paid back uh, uh, something like $30 to every dollar uh, invested. So uh, the science informed policy on this ends up being cost effective and we see that over and over again. Thanks. Thank you. And Representative Hanley has a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I believe I read somewhere, I don't have it at my fingertips that Noah predicted the, uh, the sea level rise would be I think 3.5 millimeters a year. And then they downgraded it, this the projection to 3.2 per year. So the actual trend is going down. And also, um, I, if I'm correct, I, I think I also read some time ago that the sea level rise has been happening naturally for 400 years or more. And so, uh, and because, <laughs> I'm 69 years old and uh, I started duck hunting in Marameeting Bay on the Kennebec River when I was 14 or 15. So there's, and I've hunted duck there every single year since, including this year. And I'm still hunting on the same rocks, same blinds, same mud flats. And I don't see the panic, I guess, in sea level rise, because that's all tidal. So I'm assuming that the inland bay of Marymeeting Bay would be affected by any sea level rise. And I, again, I don't see the urgency and panic that I get in the discussions I'm hearing. Uh, am I wrong to be not excited? Well, certainly sea level has been changing uh, forever. Um, it responds to geologic processes that are global. It responds to um, glaciation events, sea level has been rising in Maine for 11,000 years. Um, for the last 5,000 years, it's only been at an average rate of three and a half inches per century. Now it's at, uh, it, looking at the Portland tide gauge, it's seven and a half inches per century. We had our highest measured sea level in 2010. And it's driven by a, a number, and that was driven by a number of factors. It's not just that suddenly we had more water in the ocean. It actually had more to do with changes in ocean circulation at that time. So it really, it, it really depends on the period of time you're looking at because it rises and falls with, with uh, multiple 
uh, factors that drive it. On our webpage, we just put, put up what we call a sea level rise ticker. You can go to it and monthly, we give the statistics on the Portland tide gauge, the uh, uh, Bar Harbor tide, tide gauge and the Eastport tide gauge and give an estimate of the relative uh, height of the tide, tide, gauge, tide gauge in that month per uh, other months of the year. And, you, you'll, if you, and then we have the uh, ongoing uh, full tide gauge diagrams there as well on, on a dashboard. You can find both of those. And there are uh, rises and falls that are driven by seasonal weather patterns, seasonal ocean circulation. So yeah, you could find some data that suggests that sea level is falling for some period of time, but on average, sea level has been rising by measured instruments for a hundred years. And it, in the last 25 years, it's rising at a rate of a foot per century. Are there any additional questions for this section of the presentation or are we ready to, to proceed? Okay, I think we're ready to move forward. So that will be Dan Burgess and Michael Stoddard and Joyce Taylor. And we'll work through this section and then we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back for the panel. Let me try to share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for bearing with me. I think there's lots of questions saved up for you, Mr. Burgess. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great. I've been great. trying to, uh, I don't seem able to share. So if, if someone could give me permission to do that, that'd be great. Yes. Let's see. <clears throat> Sabrina, are you able to make that happen? You should, it should be at the bottom. You should be able to. Okay. I see it now. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. So, uh, Good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Burgess. I'm the director of the Governor's Energy Office. And uh, looking at the time, I'll do my best to, to go to go quickly through this. The focus of the presentation that I'm going to go through is really focused on some of the discussions of the at the Maine Climate Council with the Energy Working Group. Um, a lot of the issues that have been brought up today, will you know, we'll be talking talking about at the EUT committee both tomorrow and and throughout the session. So happy to have my office uh, be a part of any and all those. Um, those uh, discussions. Um, overall, the uh, energy working group was made up of a wide uh, variety of uh, those that are engaged in the energy industry from uh, uh, former from um, uh, utility commissions to labor to uh, uh, nonprofits, NGOs and, and others. So we had a really, really strong group and um, are uh, pleased with the outcome. As, as Director Pingree mentioned, there are four main recommendations, and I'll go through them, through them quickly. One is to ensure uh, an adequate, affordable, clean energy supply, and initiate a uh, power sector transformation process, accelerate uh, emissions reductions in the industrial sector, and encourage combined heat and power facilities. Um, as we think about, and I know uh, Michael and Joyce will uh, get into some of the um, uh, you know, components that are going to touch closely to the energy sector. Uh, I think it's just important to start with the baseline of information. And that is that on the on the heating side, Maine is is uh, heavily reliant on home heating oil to to heat our homes. We are uh, roughly this is from 2017. The number is pretty close uh, for the latest latest data. Around 60 percent of our homes are heated with with home heating oil, and that is the uh, that we are the green triangle on that chart of being the most um, dependent on home heating oil to heat our homes. The other orange boxes there, you can see the other New England states. So this is a, you know, snapshot into the, into where, how, how we are heating our homes. And if you look at how we are getting our electricity, it was mentioned uh, earlier that we are part of the uh, regional electric grid that ISO New England manages. So we are um, 
uh, you know, it's a, uh, important to be a part of that. This, this chart shows you the uh, total electric energy supply across the region over the last 20 years. This comes from ISO New England. And what you can see is that uh, we have undergone a rapid transformation of uh, relying on, back in 2000, relied on about 40% of our electricity came from either um, uh, coal or oil. And so what, what we've uh, 35 to 40% and that's the, the kind of two gray bars at the bottom. What we can see is going to 2019 is that that has dropped dramatically down uh, below, uh, below a percent percentage point. Uh, we do rely on those, uh, particularly oil for, um, you know, for times during uh, extreme cold snaps. Um, but you can see that the, the grid has been clean, been cleaning up over the last 20 years. And there are a number of reasons for that. You know, the, uh, uh, the price of natural gas, the aging fleet, the increase in clean energy, but wanted to start with that, that snapshot, that picture. And one of the ways that states are uh, ensuring to, to, to clean up our, our electric grid, you know, as we, as we you know, increase the amount of beneficial electrification, the amount of you know, heat pumps and electric vehicles, as was mentioned, we need to make sure that we've got the amount of energy there to, um, to power those vehicles. Um, and so last uh, last session in 2019, the legislature passed and the governor signed a commitment to increase Maine's renewable portfolio standard, um, which is the uh, at a high level is the, basically the amount of electricity that gets delivered to Maine consumers, a, a certain percentage of that coming from coming from renewable energy. And so uh, Maine had a an RPS or renewable portfolio standard of 40 percent. Um, and had leveled off and wasn't increasing. And now we have increased that to 80% by 2030. Uh, the, the top map there is a map of which states have renewable portfolio standards. Uh, it's a common tool that states use. And that bottom chart shows the um, RPS standards uh, for newer resources by state. And you can see that Maine has the most ambitious renewable portfolio standard uh, in the region. We do only make up 10% of the region's electric load, and so you know that regional coordination is, is really important. One of the ways that we're driving um, new development through the legislation that passed in, in 2019 is by um, uh, going out for uh, procurements for for new clean energy resources. And so the PUC is uh, uh, just last last year uh, went out for a, the Tranche One procurement and has awarded 17 new renewable energy projects. These are larger scale. Uh, uh, projects, um, which equates to about nine to ten percent of electric load, has a um, some really great numbers on GHG emission reductions, but also about the opportunities for jobs and economic development. They are required to uh, go out for a second procurement, which just uh, happened about a week ago, for the remainder of uh, the required amount of, um, of electricity for leading up to fourteen percent. So those those two procurements will equal fourteen percent of Maine's load. Um, going under a long-term contract. And then my office is uh, currently finalizing a study related to a required study by statute of how we meet our RPS objectives um, over the over the next 10 years. And so we are we've hired a consultant and separate from the main climate council process to look at what what do we need to do to ensure that we've got the right amount of um, renewable energy and uh, to to meet the growing demand that we have. And so we'll be publishing that soon. Uh, just very briefly, the, the consultants that, that we, we did work with on the um, Maine Climate Council uh, uh, project did do some modeling. And when you look at um, the, the, the growth that we're going to, going to see kind of Maine-wide Maine after, you know, looking at 2050, the uh, analysis could be anywhere from 2x to more than 4x the amount of electricity that, that uh, might be needed for the grid. A lot of that depends on um, how fast we electrify. How, how that load is managed. Um, can we use it uh, more efficiently? Um, can we you know, have, have rate design, which, which helps with that? And then also um, how much efficiency we do and um, what that looks like. But my question is answered, so I asked, so I wanna make sure to touch on that. So very briefly, the uh, four uh, uh, recommendations that are coming out of the Climate Council were to Again, ensure the affordable clean energy supply and work towards meeting that 100% RPS goal. Um, kind of laid out many ways in which we're doing it. Um, you know, the Climate Council report pointed to um, the study that we're doing and potentially doing more procurements based on the outcome of that study. 
It also talked about um, setting targets and policies for offshore wind, smaller distributed generation like solar, as has been mentioned, and also looking at things like energy storage to um, ensure that we're managing the grid and and, and have the opportunity to store that power if, if possible. The uh, uh, answer on offshore wind, uh, as, as uh, Director Pingree mentioned, is that um, it, offshore wind we see as a really significant opportunity for the state, both from a, an energy perspective and, and an economic perspective. Uh, we have put forward a, uh, uh, our intention to go forward with a, uh, what is being called a research array, which is 20 to 40 miles off the coast of Maine, uh, will be uh, uh, roughly 10 to 12 uh, turbine, floating turbines, and will be um, uh, 20 to 40 miles off the coast. And so we are working through that process now. Uh, with, uh, we will ultimately submit a, an application to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which is responsible for for siting um, uh, three three miles outside of uh, state or outside of state waters, so three plus miles. Um, the I think you know as the study that we're we're doing will will show the potential for offshore wind, but there is um, this this project is is contemplated to be around 150 megawatts, 140 to 150 megawatts. There are 25,000 megawatts in development or in the pipeline from Massachusetts South. So the industry is really taking hold and taking off in other parts of the country and along the East Coast. And so it is it is an opportunity. And the Climate Council report also points to needing to uh, continue to work on siting to minimize impacts of, of not just offshore wind, but all of the, uh, all of the potential for uh, uh, new clean energy. So as we add clean energy to the grid, as we add more electric vehicles and we add um, more um, heat pumps and other technologies, there was a real kind of um, signal from the energy working group that I co-chaired that we really needed a nuanced uh, process. And what is what has worked in other states is something called a power sector transformation process. So uh, a process that um, looks at uh, both utility structure, but also load management, what data could be needed, um, does does more planning and uh, really looks at some of these more complicated, tricky issues as we add add more to the grid. How is the grid managed? What policies can we put in place to ensure that we're doing it most most cost effectively? And I, I think the thought is that we get experts together, go through these issues in a detailed way to to um, bring forward the change that that we need to see. The next was to encourage uh, highly highly efficient CHP. So. CHP is the utilization of, a, of energy technology that captures the heat from the generation of electricity to then provide useful thermal energy, such as steam or hot water, so that this heat would otherwise be wasted or, or lost. And so the, the idea behind CHP is to, again, u- utilize that useful thermal energy in heating and cooling or industrial processes. Uh, the um, plan for calls for analyzing policies, potentially looking at long-term contracts, um, to, to look at what we need to do to, to do more CHP. We do have a good amount of CHP installed in, in Maine, and so I think this is a, uh, a common sense um, step to really look at what we can do to do more. And then finally, the um, last is to accelerate emission reductions from industrial use and processes. As you can see, you know the industrial sector does make up a, a, a good portion of our emissions, um, but we need to, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated nut to crack that we need to um, uh, we think have have the right folks in the room to work work with industry and others to look at what innovations might be available and kind of what we can do to, to reduce emissions long term in the industrial sector. I think it's a, a careful balance of uh, of that. The industrial sector has has done a lot um, in, in many areas already, and so what we want to do is build on that. Look at what opportunities there might be to to reduce emissions in in that sector. And. So with that, I'm happy to take any any questions or just to pass it along to Michael or Joyce, whoever's going next. Thank you. Senator Bennett, that's a question. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, the uh, question I had about that uh, demonstration project, uh, is it 16 square miles? Is that what I understand? Or is it 16 acres? Because I've heard it differently reported. I think it's 16 square miles, right? 16 square miles, that's right. And you said that we are doing it, but who is we actually? Who's, who's funding that? Who owns it? What's, what's it all about? Yeah, so the, it's a great question and um, didn't mean to skip over it quickly. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk more, more about it. The, uh, there are the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management 
manages uh, the, the federal waters. Uh, uh, so that's th outside of three miles. The, um, there are two ways in which offshore wind lease areas or, or areas are, are considered and developed. One is through a competitive commercial large scale process. And there, but there is another which allows for uh, a research application by a state uh, entity. And so we are, uh, uh, have announced our intention to pursue that research lease. Um, it is uh, proposed to be 20 to 40 miles off the coast to interconnect into the southern portion of the grid and to be, uh, like you've mentioned, 16, uh, 16 square miles. And so that's, that's about 10% or so of the uh, size of some of the uh, larger lease areas that are being proposed and developed to the, to the south of, of, of us. And I think being proposed as a stepwise approach to uh, ensuring that, you know, we're, we're taking a research focused um, approach to development um, with offshore wind. I'll just say that the, um, we've had some initial um, webinars and information sessions on it. We are going to be having uh, more scoping meetings and working group meetings coming up next week. So I'm happy to keep this committee or, or any interested party involved. We uh, definitely like your participation. But, but what, uh, so when you say we, it's the state of Maine, is it your office? Is it somebody else? And what is it costing and who's paying for it? So the state of Maine would be the entity putting forward the application to BOEM. The, uh, we have, are partnering with the uh, New England Aquaventus development team, which is uh, 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 an entity of Diamond uh, and RWE to, to offshore wind uh, development companies that are going to be utilizing the University of Maine technology. So we will be the applicant. Um, they will be the developer uh, for that project. The, as other um, renewable energy projects are, are, um, are, are financed, there's likely going to be the need for a power purchase agreement of, of some variety to uh, to, to move that forward, and we'll be wanting to uh, work on that. So there's a um, there's a New England Aquaventus is a is a for profit company. Or, or what is it that's owned collectively by Diamond and RWE? You said. Yes, that's right. Um, I'm, I want to get the I want to get the terminology right. Um, is there a document that you could share that kind of outlines the whole structure of this deal and, you know, what, you know, what's the flow of funds, et cetera, and the timeline? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I'm happy to, happy to share that with the, um, with you and other members of the committee. We have a, um, you go to main.gov slash energy. There's a whole section on the research array with a, a long FAQ that, but there's happy to answer those uh, more detailed questions too, if, if they're not in there. Thank you. Representative Hanley. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Is there uh, any estimation on the impact for rate payers with this type of a project? And it, I, I would like, uh, like uh, Senator Bennett, I'd like to have a, a breakdown of <clears throat> the state's percentage in this whole venture. Is, is this, uh, are we in this marketing with them? Or are we just simply a pass through? So the, the the ultimate cost will depend on a number of a variety of factors. Where the lease area is actually where the app the where it's sited, um, you know, there how how it's done, the number of turbines, the size of those turbines, and so there is. I don't have a, a, a concrete estimate for exactly the the, the cost of that. Then um, I'm happy to provide more information about the, the arrangement that, that we've, uh, that, we're, that we're talking about. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's odd that you don't have any cost estimates about a project that big. Uh, I mean, is this early stage development? Are we just, are these like daydreams that people are having or is this actual something that's on the planning, land, uh, getting on the planning board that's gonna go, to, go into effect? How close are we to getting yeah. towards this thing? So we are planning to submit. Uh, uh, the, the first step is really identifying the appropriate site for for the application. That will go then go to BOEM. BOEM have a public comment period, um, and as we work through exactly the um, specifics of, of where the site is, again 
you, you know, you can you can imagine how many turbines, what size, how long the interconnection needs to be. Those things will have a real impact on on the the ultimate cost of it. And so, it is you know something that we're actively actively working on. Yeah, and and you know my my constant concern is that the ratepayers and taxpayers of the state of Maine are they on the hook for something? If this is a private venture and they're using private capital, I'm fine with it as long as they're risking their neck and not mine. But I think you, we need to hear those answers. Citizens of Maine need to know how how much on the hook they're going to be for this and what it will ultimately cost them. So I, I'd like to have those answers. Happy to follow up, Representative. Appreciate the question and understand. Thank you, Representative Hanley. Representative O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burgess, for being here today. Um, that was an interesting presentation. A few years ago, I actually helped work on the Aquaventus project there. It was the one eight size model. And um, I was looking for, I, I'm always interested, I spent, I have quite a few years in finance. And so I was interested in the income versus the outlays and what we could expect in the future for an expanse in a project such as this. And um, it took me about three months to get the information. And, and maybe you can clarify if it was because it was a one eight size model that the costs were so astronomical. But I know that I was particularly interested and spoke with Habib Dagar. As I said, it took me almost three months to get the information. And when I got the information, I was re relatively dismayed because the underground um, lines that actually delivered the electricity to the um, mainland was extremely expensive. In fact, the electricity that was provided uh, cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars of investments. And when I say cost us, I mean taxpayers, not just of the state of Maine, but um, United States taxpayers with um, federal taxpayers with subsidies. And the total rate that I got back at, um, for the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of outlays, the income from that for um, electricity developed was about $220, give or take a few cents. And that was an annual amount. So I'm wondering how we can expect to get a better return on our investment. And I, if you can't answer that now, I have no problem with that, but I would love to see the financials and all the disclosures it would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I don't have that at my fingertips at the moment, but I'm happy to follow up and provide more of a, a broader picture on, on offshore wind generally. I've been uh, um, happy to do that. Great, Mr. Bridges, shall we move on to Mr. Stoddard? Thank you Sounds so great. much. Okay, I think I've unmuted myself and I think I've put my screen up on the screen. Can you all see me and hear me? That is correct. All right, let's see if I can make this look a little better. Okay. Um, so uh, just quickly, like uh, Dan was saying, we had uh, a work group that was dedicated to the sector of the economy that is buildings. Uh, generally, we think of as buildings. Um, another way to think of it is commercial and residential and industrial. And we had a great work group. Uh, you can see the, um, I'm sorry, I'm hesitating a little. I have a funny way that this is showing up on my screen. There we go. Um, so we had a, a nice cross section of folks from the trades and the, uh, including architects and engineers, some builders, some municipal officials, um, a good representation from some environmental advocates who are have have long been interested in energy efficiency programs and the kinds of things that happen in the buildings of Maine. And uh, so we had, you know, almost, I guess, nine months worth of uh, good discussions and briefings on 
the kinds of technologies that are happening in our buildings and the and the heating systems and the all the different kinds of controls and opportunities that we might have to find ways to reduce greenhouse gases. And I'm sorry, my version of this little graphic is not as pretty as the ones that preceded me, but the, the gist of it is that you see, uh, this is just a reminder of what we were focusing on in the buildings work group. We were fo focusing on the residential, commercial and industrial sector uh, and where the greenhouse gases are coming from there. Um, I, I noticed Senator Bennett asked uh, Director Pingree early on, what were the top three things you focused on? Always a great question. And um, we started out in this work group thinking, what should we focus on? And um, we focused on, uh, you know, this is sort of the same thing that uh, the same reason Willie Sutton robbed banks is because that's where the money was. And we looked for things we could do that where the greenhouse gases were. And most of that in our buildings in Maine is coming from uh, the combustion of fossil fuels, mostly to make heat. Yeah, a little bit for lighting and uh, cooling, but mostly what we're thinking about is heat. And in the case of industrials, it's, it's industrial processes, but again, usually making heat. So in Maine, as you all know, uh, what we typically do to make heat is we, and, and have for a hundred years, is we've uh, burned a lot of number two heating oil. So uh, this was where we focused as a work group on what are the technologies, what are the opportunities to either conserve that, to bring those emissions down, um, and how can we do it cost effectively? Um, Michael, you just, you know, you're, you're presenting with your notes up, note slides up. So if you want to, you might need to switch around. Uh, I guess I wish I knew how to do that. Um, thank you for that kind warning. Um, I can at least do this. Is that helping? <clears throat> so I hope people can see the six recommendations here. Um, <clears throat> we spent a good long time talking about new construction um, when you take advantage of the opportunity to build a building from scratch, you have a really good moment in time to do, to, to make some prudent decisions that will uh, help you reduce your energy load over the life of that building and to do it very cost effectively. The common um, way to influence what's going on during the building process is through building codes. So we had a long conversation about building codes and there are some interesting opportunities there. Maine has already adopted some new legislation a couple of years ago to get our state back on track with more current building codes and uh, raising the bar on the building codes. And so I think our state is, is on a good pathway there already. And it's something that every three years will just get periodically updated and, uh, and tightened. But there's still quite a lot of work to do there with training of code enforcement officers and the building uh, trades professionals um, so that everyone is apprised of the best practices and putting those into, into play and complying with the, with the building codes. Uh, the second was to <clears throat> transition cleaner heating and cooling systems. And I'll talk about that more in a second, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> but this is where there's really some interesting opportunities because of the advent of new improved technologies, especially heating uh, heat pumps, um, which are great for heating our spaces and also domestic hot water. And we've been lucky to have some good programs in place for several years in Maine. So we're already making good progress there. Um, we're all familiar with, it's near and dear to our heart, weatherization, putting more insulation in, uh, air sealing, all those good things that we know about as Mainers. Um, we have good programs in place, but we're, uh, it, it's generally lacking for um, additional funding would be the way that you would um, subsidize or, or incentivize people to do more of it. So it's always a question of where that funding might come from, whether it's available, but um, we know how to do it. Uh, it's just a question of being able to do more of it. And you heard earlier that one of the goals was to double the rate of weatherization in the state from its current levels. And there were a lot of great recommendations. I should say that over the course of the 
the whole period of this work group, there were more than 40 different specific recommendations and actions that we might take as a state to try and implement these six strategies. And I won't go into them all here, but you should know that there's a lot more detail behind these six strategies. Um, one way to implement is by um, leading by example with with the public dollars that you all control, frankly, and the executive branch. And so thinking about ways that we can make really smart investment decisions in our state buildings or other uh, structures that are that receive public funding would be a good opportunity to move this technology forward and, and, and switch to um, higher efficiency and lower carbon fuels and heating systems. Um, Dan touched on the industrial process, so I'm going to skip over that, but we also covered that, that discussion. And then um, back to some of the comments that started early on, uh, Representative Hanley and others pointed out that if we are going to have a significant shift to electricity, and you heard Dan say uh, maybe somewhere between two times and four times as much load and as much need for demand off of the grid, um, we're going to need to build up that grid and we're going to need to build up those power generation systems that are feeding our grid. And that's expensive. So if we want to minimize that cost impact, put ourselves in the best position, we got to be really smart how we not only build out that grid, but the stuff we attach to the grid with all these modern controls, all this digitization, we're now able to turn things on and off, turn them up and down, ramp them up and down in ways that are uh, lead to a lot of energy efficiencies. And so by doing that, we don't have to overbuild the grid. We can keep it at a, at a smart size. Um, and, and that's gonna take a, a big collective effort by everybody going forward. But um, I think you know, there are ways that we can do that. And lots of people are on notice that that's what we've got to do. So I just wanted to give you a quick illustration of what it looked like from the building sector. Here's one little example. On the left, you see a bar chart comparing the greenhouse gas emissions from an oil-fired boiler. And you compare that to uh, the gray bar is the emissions associated with a heat pump, even after you factor in the emissions that would be coming from the power plants that are feeding the electrical grid that's making the heat pump run. So you see a 60% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by shifting from any amount of heating that you're doing with oil to shifting to a heat pump. Um, as the grid gets cleaner and cleaner with more and more renewables coming on and less and less fossil fuel generators, that gray bar would shrink, meaning a bigger reduction in greenhouse gases. The, bar, the graph on the right shows three different scenarios that the modelers ran to show what would happen over 50, uh, the next 30 years, excuse me, if we were to phase in aggressively more and more heat pumps um, and displacing the, the fossil fuels that we currently use to heat our homes and commercial structures. And so it's really interesting to see that um, with these aggressive um, transformation of this marketplace, you do in fact get 75 to 80 percent reductions in greenhouse gases. And that is the exact target that the plan is asking us to try and hit and what, this, and what the legislation was asking us to try and hit. So we, we are really lucky to, be, to live in a time where technology, at least for the heating sector, would enable us to achieve those reductions. And if you're wondering how we're doing, um, we should feel pretty good about ourselves as a state. We're, we're number one in shifting to electrification for heating. Um, the bar graph, the, the, the graph on the right, um, which is the sort of ramping up is showing where we're right. You can see where we are, the middle of FY20, FY21. We've put in a, uh, over 60,000 heat pumps in Maine. And when I say we, I don't mean efficiency Maine. I mean the people of Maine, the businesses of Maine have put these things in. We've helped a little bit with some financial incentives, but people are going gangbusters out there. There's more than a thousand different business folks that have signed up and registered with us as, a, as an installer of heat pumps. So there are good jobs out there and they're saving people money uh, and they're making their spaces more comfortable. Their homes and businesses are more comfortable. So we're on this path to meet the 100,000 heat pump target that was instituted in LD 1766 two years ago. 
by 2025. And you see that dotted bar, that dotted line goes horizontally. That's that 100,000 additional new heat pumps on top of what we've already put in. And we can see the pathway there using the funds that we have approved now and the revenue streams that we know. Um, we believe that we will get to that target by 2025. And that was the same target that was in the, it, it equates to the target that is in the climate action plan. The last thing I'll say is um, we, we can't miss the opportunity to brag about the um, geographic distribution we've been achieving with the heat pump program at Efficiency Maine. The map on the left shows you the amount of dollars per capita or per, home, per household across the state and the darkest red areas are the places that have received the most and the lightest areas are the, are the places that have received the left the least. We have a little, a couple little pockets where we have no data for which I apologize. So I don't know how we're doing in those areas, but up in Aroostook County around Dover Foxcroft you know, in the middle of the state, um, we're, we're seeing great, great participation from um, the citizens of those areas and the, and the small businesses that are doing the installations and um, it's saving those customers money, which is the number one thing we want to see. And it's also reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 60% for every BTU that gets switched off of oil to um, heat pumps. That's what we're achieving. So we're on the right path. And I'll, I'll wrap up there. Thank you, Mr. Stoddard. Um, Representative Dudera has a question. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Stoddard. That's, that's great. And congratulations. It's, it is exciting to see this happening. But one thing I run into in my work as a realtor, and I'd love you to just clear it up once and for all, is people do, do still say that a heat pump isn't adequate for our main winters. And I believe that not to be the case, but I'd just love to hear your input on that. Oh, great question. Uh, we face this all the time. And it's just one of those things that happens when um, with the passage of time and the, and the evolution of technology, things that used to be true 10 years ago may, uh, may have evolved. And this is one of those situations. It was true in the 2000s that the kinds of heat pumps that manufacturers made did not work well in freezing cold temperatures. They were great on the, on the shoulder seasons, but not so great in the winter. And that's just not the case anymore. These new, these new units will work down to minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit there's very few hours in the year in which it doesn't, in, in which it gets below that. So they will make you heat um, all winter long. I'm gonna take a chair's liberty and ask you a question, Mr. Stoddard. I'm wondering if you could give some information as to the percent uh, difference between industry and um, individuals in the use of heat pumps in the state uh, in the last few years, if you have any data that shows um, commercial folks switching to heat pumps. So I wanna be careful. We typically differentiate between industry, meaning manufacturing and commercial, meaning all non-residential spaces like offices and schools and hospitals and such. So there's um, almost no good role for heat pumps in industry and manufacturing. Uh, other than maybe to heat office space. The, the action is all in um, living spaces and office spaces. And there, there's excellent penetration in the commercial sector. Um, they're equally as good a fit. So they have been very busily installing heat pumps. I don't have the exact split, split out for you, but um, we're, we're seeing a lot of them. And I think schools are gonna become an excellent candidate as well going forward. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Mr. Stoddard? All right, not seeing any. I think we have one more presenter, Ms. T Mrs. T Ms. Taylor. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Let me see if I can share this. Your mic is a little quiet. Okay, how's that? Oh, there you that, go, that's okay. better. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to find the button and talk to you at the same time, and that wasn't working for me. <laughs> um, I'm actually only going to show you one slide because I think you've seen a lot. Um, and transportation is in some ways a very simple um, concept to talk about, but yet a very difficult lift, if you will. Well, my goodness, um, let me go back. 
So uh, I did want to just share that we had um, a really interesting group of folks who were on the transportation working group. It was one of the ones people were sought, you know, seeking after to belong to. Uh, we had a number of the environmental groups, as well as uh, Matt Marks, who you're going to see later from Associated Contractors of Maine. We had the uh, Maine Motor Transport was on at Maine Better Transportation. We had a car dealership. Um, we had um, we had Lori Parham from AARP um, because transportation is, is, it represents everybody. And it represents those who are using transit in the state, those who can't drive but need to get somewhere, as well as really personal choice in, in what you use for transportation. So it was, it was a work really to kind of bring a group together who could really almost um, speak to individual purchasing. And we did have a number of stakeholder meetings. Um, our transportation group really focused on vehicles. Um, we didn't really um, focus on air, um, air emissions or um, airplane emissions or, or trains. We did have uh, Patricia Quinn from NEPRA was on, on our group as well. Um, and we didn't really look at marine. We did have a marine stakeholder because the vehicle transportation between light, medium and heavy duty is really about 94% of the transportation pie. And so we felt like we really um, had a short amount of time and that we needed to focus. At the end of the day, what became very clear to all of us, as much as we talked about a number of different strategies is that electrifying our fleet was really where we had to go to make a significant a significant decrease in emissions. And these numbers are aggressive. Um, and I did find out, I know, I think Representative Hanley walk, walked away, but um, we have about just under a million uh, light duty vehicles in the state of Maine registered. So you're talking about um, a goal of uh, 41,000 light duty EVs on the road um, by 2025, when you have a couple thousand or so right now. And then you're talking about 219,000 by 2030. So really aggressive goals. And um, and you know I and people in Maine keep their cars for a long time. Uh, many people um, buy used cars. Twice as many uh, used cars get sold than new cars. So this is a challenge, and we're going to have to to look at this. Michael didn't speak, I think, to his rebates, but Efficiency Maine just changed their rebates. So you can now get a rebate for buying a used electric vehicle. So I think that's gonna be a help. Um, a couple things to keep in mind in terms of you know, questioning how we're gonna get here. Uh, so Mass has just announced that you're not gonna be able to buy a new um, internal combustion engine vehicle after 2035, California is saying that. I think there's two other states in the Northeast that are getting close to saying that. There's going to start to be in the near future, I think more used product in the state. So that's gonna be more affordable for, for some folks um, because other states are gonna push the, the buying power uh, more than perhaps we will. Um, the other thing that I always say in my world, I, I am the chief engineer of Maine DOT um, and I've been um, leading the Autonomous Vehicle Commission and autonomous vehicles, you know, it, it, they're coming. Some of them are much further along than they are um, than others, but they're definitely coming and they're gonna come electric. And many of the manufacturers want to, uh, the electric um, system because it betters their technology. So that is a synergy that's happening in the background that I would just mention. Um, some of the, the policies that we've been talking about, Michael and I and Director Pingree and some others have been um, working with University of Maine, um, their economics department, and had them looking at um, what I would call um, electrification equity and how are we going to get more people, um, especially in rural Maine, who drive long distances, who may have um, older cars. You know, I think a, a transition for the the next five years may be, um, there is definitely emissions reductions in getting people into more efficient gasoline cars. And if you can get somebody who's in 15 you know, miles per gallon up to a 25 miles per gallon, that could be a transition for us to help people get to that place. So we're still having conversations around that. Um, a transportation working group will be getting back together and meeting every other month. And I think we'll be having more conversations about 
how do we get there? Um, and, and how do you, you know, there's just so many policy questions and around personal selection of a vehicle and how do we help people learn about these? We also spent some time talking again, as I just said, about increasing fuel efficiency and alternative fuels. You know, in terms of heavy vehicles, um, there is an EPA smart way. It's a voluntary program. Many of the trucking fleets um, really actually like it because they're saving money uh, by cutting their fuel use. And so really propping that up a little bit more in Maine and, and trying to get voluntary fleet compliance with that. Um, and then, you know, we do have some local biofuel and biodiesel production. There's a lot of companies that have looked into it. Um, they've struggled in terms of how to truck it. Uh, DOT is actually piloting a biodiesel uh, and, and biofuel. We had great luck with the biodiesel this year. Um, we're going to do more of it. Um, it worked really well for us. Um, it's just a matter of how much can we get really and where and how far can it be trucked. Also a conversation, the pandemic really changed how we drive. Um, for a while, we were almost, you know, at 50% of our vehicle miles traveled. We're back to hovering between three to 10% every week below. Uh, but when you think about it, um, a lot of people are not ride sharing anymore. Um, they're having to drive their kids to school. We, I mean, anecdotally, there's a lot of folks who have second homes in Maine who have come here and they're staying here and they're adding to our miles perhaps. But really with um, increased broadband, I think it becomes realistic that more people are going to be able to telework when this pandemic's over, will want to. And so how does that look? But it, I think it's an important piece of, of what we're talking about. And then um, I would call land use policies more kind of that complete streets, um, getting people to walk and bike and live in village areas. And you know what I what I would say from being chief engineer and talking to folks like the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, who was part of our group, and, and going to enough um, you know town meetings and and talk, talking to town managers, people will only walk if they feel safe. And so, how do we um, make people feel safe, be safe, and want to ride a bike and want to walk and want to live in that village area because you know it's enjoyable to them. And so those are the kinds of conversations we're having at DOT, what's our role in that? And then um, Go Maine is a ride share program. It's, it's been used in Southern Maine. Um, it is a statewide program, but a lot of people don't know about it. It's been run by the Maine Turnpike um, the last, I think seven or eight years. Maine DOT is going to take it over in July of this year, and we are going to have um, a rollout of Go Maine 2022. Um, and really, I think, you know, one thing that I've seen in doing all this climate stuff, there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions about what we should all be doing, and a lot of people who um, are really concerned about climate. We need to get those people to ride share. <laughs> You know, get some of those people um, who want want to be examples and lead by example. Um, and so we need to try to find those people and help them find a way to have a reliable ride share. So um, the other thing that I it's not on this slide, but I just wanted to mention from a transportation point of view is um, we talked a lot about adaptation um, in particular. Um, we need to do a vulnerability assessment of our transportation system. Start with sea level rise, but frankly, there's inland concerns as well. Um, we see more frequent um, large storm events, especially in Western Maine and the Crown of Maine. And we do um, lose infrastructure at times. So, you know, we really need to think about, you know, our system. You know, the reality is, you know, we've had a lot of these um, wind storms and people lose power. You know, Versa and CMP can only get out to fix these things if the roads are accessible and clear. So we have to make sure that as we um, continue to build infrastructure that we're looking at, you know, sea level rise and bigger openings of bridges and culverts so that the water can flow or we can be high and dry. And that, you know, it, that's a conversation too, especially on the coast that needs to be done with your communities. It's a system approach. Um, it has to, you know, we, we could raise the road four feet, but if it's not gonna work for the community or we're taking, you know, four houses in a village to do that, there just has to be conversation and, and we have to start having 
probably some tough conversations with communities on the, on the coast in particular. Um, so I think, uh, did I have anything else? So I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I know that um, I, I don't have as long of a presentation, but I think um, I'm sure you have some questions on the EVs and, and the numbers that we put out there. So I will stop sharing. Thank you so much for that. Are there any questions related to transportation? Going one. All right. With that, I'm going to um, move us into a break. Um, we had planned for 15 minutes, but I'd like to shrink it to 10 because we are behind schedule. So it's 12.30 now, if we could meet back at 12.40 and we'll move right into our panel at 12.40. So for the public, um, we will not be on screen. And so I encourage you just to turn your screen off and mute your mic, but not leave the meeting. Committee members, thank you.
Can you hear me okay, Representative Tucker? Uh, do we have a public link at this time? I think we're live still. Are we live? Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. My fancy earbuds ran out of juice, so I had to. <laughs> they do that after a while. Yes. They make a little ding, ding a ling sound when they're running low. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was just reminding me that I'm a dingling, but glad to know it has a better purpose. Welcome, Commissioner Beal. Do we have a we have a quorum? Uh, actually, the quorum that we had at the beginning uh, is enough. Runs through the day. Perfect. Yep. As long as we don't take any votes or try to kick Rick off the committee. <laughs> well, we should welcome Representative Gramlich, who was not here when we got started. Welcome. Thank you, Senator. I am Lori Gramlich, and I represent House District 13, which is the lovely seaside community of Old Orchard Beach. All right, uh, Rep Commissioner Beal, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Let me get my, let me share my screen here. Uh, Okay. Um, if you can tell me if you can see this, that would be helpful. I have a slide, an opening slide that says. Yes, I mean, we yes. see that. We see the whole background yeah. of the slideshow too, but yes, we see the slide. Yeah, I think it's thinking about it. <laughs> All right, how's that? Perfect. Uh, it okay. has your notes in your next slide. I don't have any notes in here, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, is the next slide, I, I know uh, Michael had a problem with that too. I'm not sure if I yeah. can. If you, if you expand the window with the first slide, it will diminish the next slide enough so, and we'll be able to see your first slide better. And you can do that by putting the cursor over the bar that separates those two windows and dragging it open further. The bar that separates these two. Oh, oh. The line, yes, right there. Uh, a little bit further over. There you go, right there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, we should be perfect at this by now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's we've been on so many different platforms between Zoom yeah. and Teams, and uh, they're all different. So, okay, sorry about thank that. You. No problem. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having us here today. I know this is a long day for you all. Hopefully it's been really interesting and will continue to be really interesting. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the work of the Natural and Working Lands Work Group, which I was a co-chair of. Um, let's see here. I'll also say before I advance my slide that, um, you know, we acknowledge as in our department in particular that Climate change impacts virtually all of the work that we do and uh, the livelihoods of many of those who re rely upon our services. So we've been really invested in this work. We have a number of staff that have been engaged in the um, Climate Council, the working groups, and uh, we are going to continue to be really engaged. So I know you've seen the slide a few times today. Uh, the only reason I'm putting up, it up here is just to say that the the really the bulk of the recommendations that came forth from the Natural and Working Lands Working Group can be found in uh, D and E, sections D and E here. So grow means clean energy economy and good jobs and protect means environment and working lands and waters and increase carbon sequestration. So um, this is to give you a, a snapshot of who served on the Natural and Working Lands Work Group, and I should give a, um, I should point out that uh, Tom Abello from the governor's office was my co-chair, and uh, we had a really great group of folks, about, well, I think, 24 members, 
um, really diverse interests from large forest landowners to small woodlot owners, loggers, environmental groups, farmers, natural resource agency professionals, scientific researchers, and more. Um, and because we were all coming from uh, sort of different perspectives, we really spent a, a good amount of time up front in the first couple of meetings, drawing on some of the, the knowledge of folks in this group and uh, outside sources as well, bringing them in to give some sort of, um, you know, some presentations that helped everybody to gain a baseline understanding of key issues related to natural and working lands. And I think that really paid off for us. Uh, in terms of our, our working group process, we, like other work groups, we held monthly meetings. We also held a lot of uh, subgroup meetings between November uh, 2019 to June 2020. And uh, in fact, I think when we tallied it all up, we we uh, we averaged that each working group member spent somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 hours uh, investing in this process. So, and we had a lot of homework too between meetings, but we had incredible participation. Uh, people showed up prepared and really engaged. And I also have to say that we had really good public engagement. Every meeting that we had, uh, we had a good number of folks that followed along and, and made great comments along the way. Uh, we of course had a public comment period and uh, integrated those comments and then uh, turned our recommendations over to the Climate Council for consideration. And so uh, a few things up front before I talk about the strategies, um, just, you know, we approach this work from a starting place of understanding that our land base is incredibly important to our economy for all the reasons you see up in the uh, right-hand corner here. In fact, our agriculture, forestry, and outdoor recreation sectors combined contributes more than $20 billion to our state's economy annually and supports approximately 140,000 jobs. And we also acknowledge, of course, uh, the ecosystem services that these lands provide as noted in the bottom right. And altogether, we believe that natural climate solutions can be good business for Maine. And in fact, investing in the strategies that we put forth could serve to grow the overall economic contribution of these sectors further. Um, we also acknowledge that this land base is already sequestering a significant amount of carbon, but we do believe there is potential to increase that amount through climate smart management activities. Um, and we also acknowledge that our lands are already threatened by climate change and sprawl. So, um, you know, these are certain certainly things that we have to be aware of. Temperature and pre precipitation changes will affect forest composition. That's incredibly incredibly important for um, both habitat reasons as well as for our forestry sector. Uh, impacts to habitat and biodiversity of plant and animal species are impacted. And you know, these are things that aren't just in the future. These are things that we are experiencing now. Increasing risk of wildfires. In fact, the Maine Forest Service, which resides in our department, had a record breaking year fighting forest fires. Uh, they responded to uh, 1,154 fires, which is a 224% increase above last year. Not the kind of record we wanna be breaking, but here we are. Uh, we see new pests and diseases and invasives in both forests and in uh, threatening agricultural crops. We see extreme wet weather events that cause erosion, uh, soil loss and water quality issues, uh, higher evaporation rates with rising temperatures and drought risk. And unfortunately, those extreme wet weather events don't really help uh, dry soil because they don't tend to, the water doesn't tend to saturate the soil as well. And again, um, Finally, loss of forest and farmland development. Uh, we know that we're losing about 10,000 acres per year. Uh, we expect that to actually accelerate. Um, so that's something that we're definitely keeping at the forefront. And um, we'll go to the next slide here. And so here are the five strategies that we brought forth. Uh, and I'll go into each one a little bit in just a moment. Uh, strategy one, conserve working and natural lands and waters through a dedicated sustained funding source to support a robust forest products and agricultural economy, increase carbon storage opportunities, avoid future emissions and enhance climate adaptation and resilience. 
Strategy two, create new and update existing financial incentives and support for private land management and infrastructure that supports climate mitigation and ad adaptation. Number three, provide technical assistance on natural climate solutions to landowners, land managers, and agricultural producers. Four, update and refocus state programs and policies to address climate mitigation and resilience. And finally, five, strengthen research and development and monitoring of climate mitigation and adaptation practices. So number one, as I mentioned before, uh, losing about 10,000 acres to development annually. Uh, we do have some existing vehicles uh, for protecting land, conserving land. Uh, the Land for Maine's Future program is certainly an important part of that and uh, would play an important role in implementing this strategy. Uh, but in the, in the uh, main climate action plan, there is a target to volunteer or increase voluntarily conserved land from the current 21% to 30% by 2030. Uh, and I, I like to point out that I, I, it's important. I think that we uh, are strategic about that and we need to be looking at um, where we've done better in some places than others over the year, years. For example, within that 20 21%, we've really only protected less than 4% of our working farmland. And with good agricultural soils being a finite resource and not something we can regenerate very easily, uh, that's something we might wanna really be thinking about. Um, and we know that protecting our land base ensures the continued availability of agriculture, outdoor recreation uh, and tourism sectors. Uh, availability of important resources that support the forestry, agriculture, outdoor recreation, and tourism sectors of our economy. And likewise, uh, it, it's an important adaptation strategy for ensuring connectivity for animal and plant migration. And again, uh, looking at this, this is a, a strategy that we think that we need to accelerate, do more than what we're doing right now, and that's why we are recommending a sustained source of funding. And we also know that, you know, this is potentially uh, from an economic standpoint, it could be one of the most cost effective strategies that are out there. Uh, but, you know, the timing is important. And I like to say land is probably only going to become more expensive, not less over time. So um, strategy two. So we know that 93% of land is privately owned in Maine, in Maine and that uh, these landowners want to be good stewards of their land. And we also think that they could benefit from financial incentives that would help them to implement more carbon friendly land management practices. And on this first point here, uh, I'll say we spent a good amount of time uh, talking about the concept of volunteer, a voluntary incentives program for small to medium sized woodlot owners uh, so we can capture more carbon. And we had uh, actually a, a subgroup that did a little bit of work on this. And um, we, we think that moving, moving this to implementation is going to require, of course, additional uh, work and stakeholder involvement. And so that's what we are going to be working on in the near future. Uh, there's also an opportunity to look at updating some of our current uh, use taxation programs and to also consider providing funding to support the use of agriculture and forestry mitigation and adaptation practices. We can look at incentivizing infrastructure and technology upgrades to support the adoption of desirable practices, including on-farm renewable energy use and use of low impact logging equipment, for example. We can also look at uh, high efficiency wood heating systems and um, utilizing wildlife friendly infrastructure and road crossings. And in the last bullet here, uh, we did also have a sub strategy uh, related to investment in local food systems. And in the climate action plan, there is a, uh, a target of producing 30% of the food we consume in Maine by 2035. We currently import about 90% of what we consume. Um, and then the higher target is to produce 50% of what we consume by 2050. And this gives us an opportunity to ensure that, the, that we're using climate friendly practices in food production. And the alternative is that we continue to export our carbon footprint related to food production. Uh, strategy three, 
Um, once again, we you know we rely on private landowners to continue to be good stewards of their land. Uh, there are currently about 86,000 fam family landowners who hold 10 acres or more, and many of these woodlots, particularly in southern Maine, are not being actively managed for either timber production or wildlife habitat improvements. And likewise, many farms could increase usage of good soil conservation practices with some uh, technical assistance support. Uh, there are numerous sources for technical assistance on climate friendly land management, uh, but many of these entities are understaffed and uh, we acknowledge that, you know, to really provide adequate technical assistance to landowners, there needs to be a one on one component because there, there really aren't one size fits all sort of um, solutions here. And so we recommend additional resources and better coordination between agencies. Uh, and also, um, uh, yeah, so that, that was my last point, sorry. Uh, the next strategy, strategy four, uh, this one, we really feel like we, the state can lead by example here uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, we can begin by looking at existing policies and programs and tools that we already have and maximizing opportunities to reinforce climate friendly practices from how we acquire and manage our public lands to recognizing the need to assess and improve state, regional, and local land use planning efforts, as well as by prioritizing purchases of main agricultural products and prioritizing use uh, and marketing of innovative wood-based products produced in Maine that can replace other materials with a higher carbon footprint. We also need to ensure that our environmental review and permitting processes are effective and efficient. And our working group noted that the challenges of balancing the need for significant increases in renewable energy um, development with the need to maintain our working force and agricultural land. So this is where land use planning is particularly important to us. And we also need to build our local food economy um, that didn't end up being a bullet on the slide, but this did end up also um, uh, being a sub strategy on strategy number four. And then uh, number five here, um, we know that we need research and support of agriculture and forestry mitigation and adaptation practices. Um, and we also need to monitor to inform our adaptive management practices uh, this is where partnership with our universities and colleges is really critical. Um, and they've already been a great partner in this process to date. I'm sure you've heard about that already. And we need we need R&D and planning to grow and strengthen our um, across all of these fronts. Uh, and then finally, just to sum up um, help what our, what we're really getting at here is that healthy forest soils and natural areas will sequester more carbon, increase our resiliency to climate change and create new economic opportunities for Maine businesses and workers. And finally, um, if you are interested, there is a lot of background uh, material behind these strategies um, that you can access on, on this website here. And uh, I'm sure we can make it available to you in a, it, this is a long, uh, <laughs> a long URL, but I'm sure we can make this document available to anybody who would like to see it uh, very easily. And that is the overview. Great, thank you so much, Commissioner Beal. And it appears as if Senator Bennett has a question. Um, before you start, Senator Bennett, um, Commissioner Beal, could you end the screen share so yep. that folks can? Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Commissioner um, and Chair uh, Chairperson Brenner. <laughs> I don't know how you like to be referred to uh, as, as Chair, Chairwoman, Chairperson, but I think uh, it's Madam Chair. Madam Chair. All right. Um, I wanted to. Um, ask, you know, not that I'm opposed to it, but uh, how does uh, wildlife friendly crossings uh, relate to climate? Uh, a lot of it has to do with um, habitat connectivity and making sure that uh, animals and plants can migrate uh, as the as the climate warms. Um, 
All right. That doesn't sound like a mitigation strategy, but I, I don't. Maybe there's some science that I don't understand. That's okay. It's a small point. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I can certainly. I I mean, I I will say that. Um, you know, that is something that we we certainly have more information about in the background materials. If you if you want to look, take a look, I'd be happy to send you the the template um, that has all of the background background discussions behind all of the different strategies. I don't need to see all of it. It was a specific question, but thank you. Representative Bloom. Hi, I just wanted to, to help out a little bit with, with Rick's question is that, you know, the mitigation strategies were, when we were working on these working groups, we had mitigation strategies, which was really reduction of carbon and adaptation or resilience strategies, which is about dealing with the effects that are actually happening. So they, the, those things get, the, the, they're both addressed and they both get um, talked about in, in all of these strategies. So right. they're kind of combined. Are there additional questions for Commissioner Beal? I have one question for you. Do you have a recommendation for the size bond package that you're looking for for the LMF? Um, well, I am. I I will defer. I know the governor is interested in uh, in seeing funding uh, for LMF for the LMF program, and so I know there are a number of different recommendations that have been out there. Um, we we would love for the number to be robust. Thank you. And are there others? If not, I think we'll move on to Ms. East. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. Is she here? Oh, yes, I see you now. There you are. Do you see? Great. There, I've got my mic on. Did Have I managed to share the right screen? Yes, we can see you and your screen and we can hear you. Thank you so much. Excellent, okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Beal, I'm going to follow your pattern somewhat. Um, and um, good morning, everybody, I guess, uh, afternoon. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share all of this with you. Um, the working group that I was the co-chair of was Community Resilience, Public Health and Emergency Management. Um, all three are related, but resulted in the largest work group. You can see the composition in front of you. Um, very diverse, academia, nonprofit, government, municipal, regional, business, utilities. Um, I'll let you just sort of eyeball that for a second. All of the, the uh, lists of the working group members are available on the website and then these slides as well. So um, one of the challenges that we faced um, along with uh, everybody working during the pandemic is that our co-chairs were very much involved with responding to the pandemic. So uh, just a shout out to Rebecca Boulos from the Maine Public Health Association who stepped in for, for Dr. Shaw, um, as well as uh, people who stepped forward to help Annie Fuchs uh, as well, because um, they had a lot going on while we were doing this work. Uh, so. I'm going to use the, uh, this um, eight climate action strategies rubric just to sort of tie this presentation together. Um, similar to the way Commissioner Beale described it, the strategies that our working group are mostly represented by are F, G, and H. So I'm going to go into those in detail. Um, and I won't uh, necessarily um, discuss them right now, but let's advance. Here we go. So um, with the, um, okay, what have I advanced? Come on, there we go. Strategy F, build healthy and resilient communities. Um, this was uh, one where we discussed how to empower local and regional community resilience efforts. I think you've already um, had some discussion today. Um, uh, Representative Dudera specifically noted that in Camden, whereas they've, uh, committed to the climate action plan and uh, are raising some local funds, uh, they need help. Um, 
there's also um, this adoption of local sea level rise projections, um, strengthening tools, and then a whole lot of the public health recommendations are embedded in that one statement of strengthen public health monitoring, education, and prevention. So I will try to do some of that justice today, but um, want to specifically let you know that there's considerably more uh, information in the working group report. But to go uh, into a little bit more detail into strategy number one from the resilience um, subgroup of our three, we took a fair amount of time and had additional assistance from other folks in state gov government, as well as uh, people from the regional planning commissions and from the university to take a look at virtually all of the laws that affect land use and water use, and especially where they interact, to draft some sub-strategies about how they could be changed and updated. Um, we were very much rooted in the output from the science and technical committee um, and, and also um, multiple times in our conversations, we wanted to minimize a compliance burden across the board. Uh, people who had to regulate any change, any, anybody who had to be the regulated community to change. So, so in our deliberations, that comes clear. Um, and um, we wanted to not just sort of respond with any sorts of restrictions, but really look at the other side of it, which is to how to enable development where it makes sense to develop and out of harm's way, if you will. We did have three strategies, um, which are there in the diagram to the right. And I, as I summarize it, it's the rules, help with them, and then money. I'm not going to go into the money so much today because it actually comes out in the final set of recommendations in the entire report in terms of implementation. But suffice to say that we, we did some research, we've got lots of um, connections, references, footnotes in our report, the working group report, to what other states have done and what has worked in other states. So I'm just going to leave it at that for, for the time being. Um, in terms of where this stands now, because this was our, these were our recommendations essentially last June, we do have, there is a bill uh, pending from Representative Bloom um, for improvements to uh, Title 30A, that's the Planning and Land Use Regulation Act and then others in terms of adopting sea level rise project projections from DEP. But be aware, the work we did in the time that we had, these are drafts. This is our best thinking, and it's very much intended to uh, move forward with obviously the legislature's input, your input, um, likely some working group um, uh, activities uh, this session and through the summer, in order to fully craft changes that you will um, be deliberating on this ses session and next session. So switching to the, the next slide, uh, speaking to this whole overall is issue of the assistance that communities have to address the impacts of climate change. What on earth just happened to my screen? Sorry, I don't know how that happened. Um, it's back to the map, yes? Good, okay. So <clears throat> what this map describes across our municipal civil divisions is essentially the uh, dearth of capacity. Where it's blue, you've got both local and in-house and regional support for planning in terms of resilience. Where it's yellow, you've got regional and that's essentially the, the, the unorganized territories where we have regional offices. But the orange and red are where there is no local capacity and there's very thin on the ground regional capacity. And so it gives you a snapshot and you know, we can quibble, some of this has changed, some is better, some is worse actually, uh, as time progresses. But you can see that there is a significant gap in support uh, for communities to be able to address 
um, resilience issues, to assess their vulnerabilities and, and then to do something about it. So the, the details within our strategy uh, have a lot to do with uh, training the trainer, supporting uh, regional, aid, regional planning organizations, uh, leveraging the expertise in the nonprofit sector to then help the regions who help the towns and trying to find some as many efficiencies as possible. Um, the other issue around technical assistance, whoops, went too far, um, was we talked a lot about not reinventing the wheel. We don't need to recreate uh, or to create a new governing structures and processes to deal with resilience. We can build it into existing um, uh, boards, commissions, um, land use laws. Um, and also that uh, one size does not fit every community. The issues in coastal and rural areas are radically different. Um, and the size and scale and type of community demands different types of collaborations and assistance. Um, so, so that really runs through um, our uh, recommendation around technical assistance. Um, moving uh, on to the, the group of uh, public health recommendations, this gives you, you know, the, the, the four areas, so monitoring, public education, reducing impacts. And then the seventh one also has to do with mitigation, get, recognizing that uh, hospital systems themselves generate a great deal of greenhouse gas emissions. So the detail that the public health uh, subgroup of our uh, large working group went into has considerable background and rationale for why you can make, why and how you can make changes in this area. So uh, there's pilot programs, um, as well as uh, a need for, um, for more money, um, which is true also in, uh, if I could go back one slide actually, um, sorry, back to this one. We know that there is the need for more money. Um, this map right here shows it to us. Um, but we also recognize that money is, is difficult to obtain in, in the economic situation that we're in. So um, we uh, very much stressed efficiencies um, and collaborations. So moving down now from public health uh, to moving to um, invest in climate ready infrastructure. So G, um, this was what the um, public, the emergency management subgroup was completely focused on, that we have uh, vulnerabilities and need to provide guidance as well as a fund that can help with um, securing federal dollars. Um, there are some, some um, bills um, pending on this issue uh, in the legislature. Uh, there's also the, the governor's bond issue that we've heard about already this morning. Um, so I would just uh, really underline here that um, the, the work of, of this, uh, the emergency management group provides tremendous detail inventorying what our vulnerabilities are in, on the big ticket items. So the large sewage treatment plants, the large sections of route one that are vulnerable to sea level rise and could have the most sort of catastrophic um, impacts if they were to be overwhelmed or fail. Um, and so their strategy um, is, is one where um, it, it's, it's one strategy. It's the creation of the state infrastructure adaptation fund uh, to both enable municipalities to um, uh, do the design work ahead of time and to um, come up with that cost share for the federal dollars, because it's almost always 25% cost share on these big ticket items. And this example here, I think, provides a, the best illustration of how much um, money can be saved with some advance um, efforts um, in adaptation ahead of time, or, or yeah, adaptation and prevention ahead of time. There are federal studies or nationwide that show that a dollar spent on um, uh, prevention and uh, 
adaptation measures ahead of time can save you $6 in federal disaster relief um, after the fact when say a sewage treatment plant like this is overwhelmed. And you can see the comparison there. That by the way was also something, we don't know that we've specifically mentioned today, but the economic analyses that are integrated into the final report did analyze what's the cost of doing nothing. And, and um, it's not, if, if, if we do nothing, it's not free. Um, and so uh, I think that was one of the big strengths of this initiative is to say, yeah, we're gonna have to spend some money, but that doesn't mean that doing nothing means we spend no money because um, the issues are upon us. Okay, let me get down to this one. So then back to our overall set of eight climate strategies and H. Um, is, is the final one and there's some of the detail where um, this is one that cut across our efforts as well as multiple other working groups and that is an overall raising of awareness both its impacts and its opportunities uh, where we need public education and that's in the public uh, school system as well that was reinforced multiple times by the youth members of the climate council um, and this notion of a climate core, uh, the potential for workforce development is, is huge uh, in mitigation and adaptation efforts. Um, and also the, the business community is already very much leading the way um, on these, um, these activities in strategy H. So I'm gonna leave it there in the interest of just moving along and I will stop sharing right there if there are questions. Thank you so much, Ms. East. Sure. Does anyone have a question? Thank you. Yes, Representative Tucker. Just a procedural yeah. matter. I just like, like to ask the chair how she plans to proceed with the rest of the program today. Just. Um, just continue it until we're done, I suppose. That would be my preference. I'm, I'm very excited to hear from the last panel. Not that I haven't enjoyed all of the other presentations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Senator Carney. Thank you. I had a follow-up question about the, um, the infrastructure and creating the straight state infrastructure adaptation fund. And my question would be, um, did the group give thought, any thought to where that would be housed and how it would be administered? I agree that it's a really vital element, not just of that aspect of the climate plan, but each aspect actually. Some of the, uh, the models that we looked at in other states um, had suggestions that ranged from um, in, uh, setting up its, uh, its own um, infrastructure. Others had to do with, uh, or, or had um, recommendations that it could go in a, in a comparable um, entity like the Maine Municipal Bond Bank. Um, others said, you know, link it to the economic development um, and, uh, and uh, wastewater treatment bond funds so that, um, and I think the thinking here is, this is the financial side of things. So have all of the expertise around finance be in with the people who know finance, programmatic issues in say, for instance, the line agencies, so that you're not dealing with multiple different ways of, of seeking money. And you can leverage say a community development block grant with an infrastructure and, and a FEMA grant. So I don't know exactly how that will um, sugar off because our research showed suggest certain ways that it's been done in other states. And I guess the, the real short answer is I don't know yet, but I think we've got models that have shown that it can work. And so we don't need to reinvent that wheel. And we are certainly seeking to do it in a way that is um, that's efficient. Um, so that's a to be continued question, I would say. Thank you. And thanks for including it in your part of the report. Sure. Any additional questions? 
Right. Seeing none, I would uh, ask Mrs. Ms. Leiden. Am I saying that right, Leiden? Kathleen, do we see her? I am here. Oh, we hear you. Often oh, pronounced. you are. We see you. Welcome. Okay. Do you see my slideshow? Not yeah. yet. Is it Leiden or Leiden? It's Leiden. Great. Thank you. There are a lot of us in uh, County Clare, apparently. I'm sorry, I'm trying to fiddle with this. I am no longer an expert. Okay, how about now? Not seeing you. Do you see the screen share at the bottom of the Zoom block? I do, I just did my screen share. Um, no, you're not no, seeing it? No. Um, Sabrina, are you able to help? Are you seeing it now? No. I'm not sure why it wouldn't be working. We did have it up earlier when she tried. Or Sabrina, did I, do you have my slides or the, um, Let's see. the PDF? Yes, you sent it to me, I believe. I'm sorry about this. It really did work. Okay. okay, thank you. That's the patient's part of our okay. new world. I'll just tell you who I am. Um, Senator Brenner, Representative Tucker, and members of the committee, thanks so much um, for including me this afternoon. I'm Kathleen Layden, and I work in uh, the Department of Marine Resources Bureau and Policy and Management under Commissioner Kelleher and I direct the NOAA-funded coastal program. Um, I co-chaired the uh, Climate Council's Coastal and Marine Working Group, along with Heather Leslie from the University of Maine, who is the director of the Darling Marine Center. And I'm gonna uh, try to make up some time today. Um, the Coastal and Marine Working Group's recommendations also spanned the um, high-level strategies that Judy made reference to, and she kept coming back to that main slide. Are you seeing my slideshow yet? We are not. Oh, goodness. Okay, well, you know what? Maybe I will just not use slides. I was uh, thinking of giving you a PowerPoint break, but um, let me see if I can. I will put myself back on. Can you see me now? Okay. We can. Yeah. Did you see me that whole time? We could. Excellent. Okay. Anything awkward. Okay. No worries. <laughs> okay. So um, let me just do this again here. Okay. So um, so again, we sort of span um, several of the types of recommendation areas. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of breeze through this. Um, Following along Commissioner Beal, we did look at the opportunities associated with climate change and coastal and marine resources. And I did have a slide that showed you, um, so we have a, a technical assistance strategy that um, in addition to coastal towns is also, will also be aimed at seafood harvesters and other users of the marine environment rather than just municipalities. We have some strategies around nature-based climate solutions um, involving um, restoration of coastal and marine environments that we think will create restoration jobs and save money. Um, third, there are some new and emerging seafood opportunities as we begin to see you know, potentially new species across our range in the Gulf of Maine. And then um, finally, in terms of Maine's um, working waterfronts and ports, there may, may be some opportunities for business development associated with renewable energy and other, um, another, uh, other new opportunities associated with climate change. So multiple screens here. I'm coming to you from the coastal town of Hollowell, high on the banks of the Kennebec River in case Using up some time here. I'm so sorry. Okay, here we go. 
So our first strategy was an overarching one, and that is to track climate change in the coastal and marine environment in a more effective and comprehensive way. Um, these recommendations, um, as you, you saw in Bob Marvini's presentation and that of Ivan Fernandez, they've also spent some time looking at this. And I think our monitoring recommendations for coastal are gonna end up being rolled up into a more um, comprehensive climate strategy, hopefully. Um, state agencies have long-term monitoring programs. DMR at the West Booth Bay Harbor Station has the longest uh, record of temperature in the state. Um, we have a long-term trawl survey looking at fisheries and different critters. We really need to have those maintained and um, enhanced. And in that way, we can leverage citizen monitoring, universities and colleges and NGOs. Okay, our next recommendation related to technical assistance and outreach to the audiences that I just told you about. Um, uncertainty is a huge issue in the coastal and marine environment. We hear that from fishermen all the time. There are a lot of unknowns and uncertainties in their industry, but helping them prepare better for changes in um, you know, their business practices or business plans is really important as we face climate change. So um, talking about a coastal and marine information exchange that would be accessible, that would provide this climate information, and then launching a seafood business council where this would ideally provide harvesters, businesses, and working waterfronts with um, better information about climate. We have an, I'm not gonna go into examples, but um, a lot of these involve we have existing programs in many of these areas. We just lack capacity and funds to reach a broader area audience and state government, being frank. Um, our next strategy was to enhance mitigation by conserving and restoring coastal habitats. So this is on the greenhouse gas side, um, or excuse me, the, the carbon sequestration side, because in addition to forests that Ivan Fernandez spoke about, um, marine uh, environments such as tidal marshes, areas of submerged aquatic vegetation, eelgrass, and so forth, um, store carbon. And we'd like to see a comprehensive inventory of what we call, we call this blue carbon, um, a comprehensive inventory. And then what, what we'll achieve through targeted restoration and more effective management of these um, resources. And we do need, um, financial mechanisms as well, um, and incentives to achieve this goal. And I think those have been touched on some in the previous presentation. So next, um, with nature-based solutions, promote climate adaptive planning, ecosystem planning and management, and that's a mouthful. And um, Judy East spoke about comprehensive planning and planning for communities, but um, we know that the coastal marine environment is more resilient when it's healthy, when it's restored, when it offers us multiple benefits such as flood storage, pollution remediation and the like. So that um, we, we hope to um, really get more projects that focus natural solutions and by that I mean um, beach and bluff management, beach nourishment and selected cases, the use of um, natural materials for shoreline erosion mitigation and so forth. And these projects, um, the climate plan talks about shovel ready projects that we begin to build up an inventory of those projects that are um, either we wanna seek funds for or whether they could be fund through, through something like an infrastructure trust fund if, if that included natural based infrastructure. And then um, finally in that um, recommendation, we had also called for the strengthening of our stormwater management tools. And this relates to um, Judy's uh, public health monitoring um, and the impact of increased stormwater on um, nutrients in the marine environment and the results um, on our uh, clam flats and aquaculture facilities. Uh, second to last uh, strategy is managing for the resilience of Maine fisheries and aquaculture businesses. And again, this relates to information support 
um, market support, building business resilience. And at our agency, in combination with the regional and um, the regional agencies that manage some of Maine's fisheries, um, species that we harvest for, um, is to adapt as fisheries are adapting and critters are adapting to challenges like temperature and other things, how do our management regimes need to change? That's not all up to Maine. As I said, we work in um, with regional commissions as well. Um, and maybe an example of that is I on the slide, envision a um, wonderful server serving up a plate of um, fried green crabs, which you've heard about though. She's got a big plate of fried green crabs and she's presenting them. And I'm not sure that I want to eat them, but that's an example of creating a fishery out of an invasive species. I promised you this would be the last, I really mean it. And this is related to our working waterfronts, the critical edge that's so important to our economy. Um, these places, these specific geographies where there are water dependent uses have to adapt to sea level rise, storm surge and flooding. And you saw from that graphs from Bob Marvini, how many days of flooding um, that were predicted for the Portland waterfront. These facilities are made to be wet, that's obvious, but um, structural improvements are needed, um, including, uh, what would you call it, um, deflected maintenance and then in, a, in addition, um, raising some facilities, getting infrastructure beyond um, harm's reach and so forth. And again, these dock and pier owners need financial and technical assistance. We, is that my slideshow? Great. See, there are the green crab fryers. Okay, um, so I think that actually is it for me. Um, I will say that there were um, several working waterfront um, managers that we talked to who um, really spoke about uh, redevelopment opportunities. If other non-water dependent businesses start moving off the edge, there could be opportunities there. Um, for additional water dependent uses. And um, lastly, as Joyce mentioned, although marine emissions are a small part of the pie, we've agreed to continue discussions with, um, with our port um, managers, working waterfront owners about seeing what we can do um, to reduce that footprint. Um, this bottom photo is just an example of a a uh, fishing co-op in Islesford that has um, installed solar arrays. So when the, the technology is of the right price and it makes a good business decision for the working waterfront owner, I think we'll, we'll be seeing more of these um, types of things installed. So with that, um, my last slide has the, the big URL for the um, Climate Council Working Group report and um, Hannah, put the shorter URL to all the materials in the chat. With that, thank you for bearing with my technological difficulties and um, for listening. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Does anyone have any questions? I would try the green crabs, just a comment, not a question. <laughs> Senator Carney. Very quick question. I'm sorry we didn't get to see your slideshow. Would you be able to email it to the committee so that we can look through it? Absolutely. I'll give it to your clerk. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, not seeing any. Let's move on to our um, panel of uh, citizens and learn more about how the climate report might affect our economy. Senator Brenner, I'm just gonna quickly um, chime in as they, they get on. I, I'm, I greatly appreciate the citizen members of the Climate Council. I will never put them at the end again because I, I know that they all have other jobs and lives. And so I'm grateful that they participated in the main Climate Council's efforts. And as they get on, um, Matt Marks, Pat Strout, um, I think that Melissa Law is still out there and Jesse Perkins. And I think we asked them each just to talk 
a little bit about their perspective on the Climate Council's work, the, the impact on, on their particular industry and why it's important, and also sort of the, both the challenges and opportunities um, that the climate plan and, and climate in general mean for their industries. Um, so I see, I know Matt had to maybe potentially leave. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll start with Matt and do Matt, Pat, um, Melissa, and then Jesse, if that works for them. So much for your patience and we're glad to have you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Hannah, as well. Um, if it's okay, I'll just take a few minutes to sort of explain what, uh, from our perspective, our engagement was on the, on the council. If that's all right with you, Senator. Um, so Perfect. my organization is uh, the Associated General Contractors of Maine. Uh, we've uh, been operating here in Maine since 1951, but nationwide, uh, we've been around since 1918. So we have a pretty long history here in the country. Uh, we're commercial contractors, and for for Maine folks, uh, what that really means is uh, we represent uh, all things commercial construction. So it's everything from vertical buildings to water wastewater to energy, uh, highway infrastructure. So pretty much everything you you use at whether it be from your home or to get to work, uh, we're somehow engaged in building that infrastructure. Um, I was, uh, I was very pleased to have the opportunity to, to participate in the process. And I can tell you that uh, from my perspective, when I first went to the orientation, I knew it was gonna be a, a pretty tough task uh, ahead. Uh, and you know, the last uh, year has been certainly uh, informational, not just for me, but I think the other members of the council will tell you as well, we all, we all learned a lot. Um, I participated in uh, the transportation group as well. Uh, so I spent time working on that. Uh, that's a big part of our industry, of course, although we still paid attention to the other divisions and uh, spent time uh, going through each of their uh, respective reports that we got sometime in midsummer. I thought that it was collaborative. Uh, the process at the transportation level had the appropriate amount of folks there. We had construction design and engineering. Uh, from our perspective, we had subgroups that were broken out. I'd like to just thank the staff at Maine DOT for making that uh, pretty easy considering how many people that we had engaged, which is a great thing. Um, and, you know, throughout the process, uh, I thought that the team was very thoughtful about the fact that this not only uh, had potential impacts uh, both ways for our industry, but that they were listening to the input from us on the kind of things that we would see as a potential challenge uh, to help move our industry towards where the plan goals were headed. Uh, particularly when it comes to jobs, uh, I'd like to touch on that just a little bit. Uh, we've, uh, our industry has been building a lot of the components that are in the plan today. So each section, uh, probably has something uh, related to construction. So whether it be uh, looking at the resilient community pieces, uh, which may be how we design bridges or culverts, or uh, even the highway infrastructure or roads that may abut uh, water areas that need to be adjusted or changed. Uh, sometimes it could be shoreline stabilization. Other times it may be just where we actually place or locate a road or a bridge or the size or capacity of it. All those things uh, relate to resilient community work. Uh, electric vehicle charging stations, for example, uh, we see that as a growing opportunity for our members, both not just our electricians, but also engineering services that will provide some of the guidance on when the, where and when those should best be placed around the state. Um, on the building section, I think you'll see for jobs, uh, we've been, uh, our industry has uh, accommodated to many uh, types of uh, green building standards, whether it be LEED or other, uh, there's a few other as well that our folks have been building to over the years. And we've been engaged with the Maine State Building Code, oh boy, since inception. In fact, one of our folks sat on the initial committee that helped draft the first round of rules. Uh, and today we're still doing that. So I can tell you that we've been engaged in that all along. Um, for clean energy, uh, you know, I can tell you that for jobs, uh, we uh, felt pretty thankful back during the last recession when the opportunities arose here in Maine for us to build uh, clean energy facilities. Uh, that's everything we're starting really with uh, hydropower a long time ago to now uh, looking at uh, wind power. Uh, we did that work throughout the recession and that there's a lot of firms here who become uh, a specialty of theirs and they're actually using that 
craft across the country. In fact, we have some firms today who are doing work in the Mid-Atlantic and they're from Maine. So we're pretty proud of the fact that they learned and are applying those skills across the country. And today with solar, um, we have a good deal of our members are installing both commercial and residential solar. Uh, it's putting to work uh, just so many different entities, whether it be the folks who actually build the structural components or whether it be uh, the folks who are doing the electrical work or the site work to prepare uh, the facilities for that. And on the transportation piece, I think that engagement has been uh, particularly interesting for us because uh, we have a lot of folks in our industry who are always trying to think ahead about what the next uh, way to move people from A to Z, I guess you'd say. Um, I think that's where you know we spent a good deal of time and obviously you've gone through the climate report and you see what the potential is there to tackle some of the climate goals related to transportation. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, one of the things and I don't know if they touched on it or not that is out for bid now and I know it's got some attention in the press but just the things about being able to move traffic better. Uh, so if you think about the, the light cycle changes that are happening and the ability to add smart technology in the light cycles is going to be really important. Uh, for example, um, you know, when a truck comes up and it stops at a traffic light, there's now new technology that will actually recognize that's a tractor trailer so we can keep them going through the traffic, not to delay and sit and idle at that light. Uh, that, that grant and that funding is out today and they're going to start doing more of that installation across the state. I think that's a terrific job opportunity. In fact, uh, give a highlight an example. We're seeing a company that sort of growing out of that opportunity in Southern Maine that didn't that wasn't here before. Um, you know, from my perspective, I could tell you that you know, obviously, uh, there are not all things that everybody's always pleased with in, in the in the process. I mean, there are going to be outcomes that may affect one way or another our industry. But uh, we also spent a lot of time talking about those and what those items could be and then how we can tackle those over time. And I thought everybody was pretty considerate about what that would look like uh, for an impact for, for our industry overall. Uh, some of the challenges right away that we're going to continue to talk about, for example, is in the heavy truck market. We're still pretty limited on what kind of opportunities there might be to convert those to something other than fossil fuel powered today. And I think that um, that's quite a ways away. So we focused on the parts of the transportation sector that could be moved along a lot quicker. Um, we, we see a bright future when it comes to the clean energy market. Our folks have been building not only renewable energy, but upgrading our transmission delivery system. And I think that will open up the door for more jobs here in the future. Um, when it comes to some of the other stuff that I think Oh, you know, you, you certainly, if you, if you get grazed through the plan, you may, may not see this stuff jump out at you. But when you think about water wastewater, for example, uh, the water wastewater upgrades that have been happening around the state, and there's obviously a very large project in Portland right now where they're trying to make sure that that, uh, that uh, stormwater doesn't end up directly in our, in our, our natural water. Uh, those kind of projects like that are going to be very impactful. And the state's invested quite a bit of money to date, but I still think there's more opportunity to get matching grants and other things to use to make sure that we can continue to tackle that and keep our, our water as clean as possible. Uh, there are some things that are happening already that started a few years ago that are going to continue. I mean, we look at the culvert program, for example, it has two benefits. Uh, it's not only is it protecting species that want to travel upstream and downstream, uh, it's also protecting the assets around it. So everything from your road infrastructure to high uh, to storms that hit that we've seen in the last few years. And it just, um, some of those structures have been there for a hundred years and it's, it's about time that we replace those. So we're really excited about those opportunities. I think as this moves along, there's still a lot of details that we have to work out, but I can tell you for the first round uh, that we were pleased that everybody had a chance to, to weigh in and um, have their viewpoint heard. And I think the folks on that committee spent a lot of time working together to try to come to a, a, good, a good plan and a compromise. I'm happy to answer any questions. I certainly don't want to consume um, too much of the time of this of this part of the panel. That was great. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Marks, for your remarks. Thank you. Mr. Strach. 
Yes. Um, saying your name correctly? It, it's very close, um, I, I'll, but I'll answer to anything. It's uh, uh, Patrick Strauch. It's a K sound on the end. Uh, Excellent. All the, right. Thank the you. German, the German snuck into the Irishman somehow there. Uh, but Senator Brenner and uh, Representative Tucker and members of the committee, um, I was going to share our screen with you in just a minute here, but I first wanted to describe who uh, I represent. Um, it was an honor for me to serve on the governor's council. It was uh, certainly a huge collaboration with a lot of different colleagues and uh, the forest industry um, has uh, a lot to uh, contribute going forward. Um, my background is I'm a forester by trade, but I've been working for the council for the past 18 years as the executive director. And we try and represent the broad spectrum, anything related to wood, uh, the harvesting of it, the manufacturing of it. And we represent about um, uh, 1.85 million acres of uh, forest land. Um, so it's, it's uh, you'll be a committee that will will be in front of regularly and uh, look forward to it. Can you see my screen with uh, just a few slides that are on there? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, well, what I thought I'd use my time to do is to show you the, the industry um, with the help from the congressional delegation, in particular, Senator King and Collins helped us fund, uh, and we're still in the middle of it, sort of a strategic planning process. It's called For Maine. It involved the woodlot owners of Maine, state government, federal government, uh, professional logging contractors, the Maine Development Foundation, University of Maine. It's an ongoing effort. And so we got kind of a head start on thinking about um, the forest opportunity roadmap, we call it. And as the council was formed, the Climate Council, we were able to share a lot of our thinking about where our industry is going. And the, the matchup you'll see is really um, uh, quite interesting. It's the whole idea is Maine needs to diversify its, its uh, forest products portfolio. And as we began to look at climate change opportunities, we developed this concept of a bioeconomy and you'll see that in the climate change report that this is a prominent part of uh, this discussion and the things that we can offer in the forest economy. Uh, just trying to advance this a little bit here, there we go. Dr. Fernandez talked about the land aspects of our industry and um, I was amazed at how much our, uh, our forests are really uh, sequestering carbon. And it's a great opportunity for us in the state to talk about that. Uh, a state with 90% forest land and a relatively low population level gets us into this 60% category of uh, absorbing the, or sequestering the emissions that we have. And that's uh, significant for us and the forest products only enhance that uh, in the durable goods that we sequester. So in the Climate Action Plan, the discussion about uh, um, preserving that land or protecting it, we've had great success with working conservation easements and we're certainly supportive of that ongoing effort in areas of the state where it makes sense. Um, but the other part of this that um, is really important is that to have healthy forests, forests that are resilient, uh, we have to have markets for wood. And so this, was, this is a theme that you'll see in the Climate Action Plan as well. And we've got a lot of traditional markets, a lot of traditional products in our sawn timber uh, oriented strand board plants that are up north. Uh, all of these are in demand now as uh, 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 materials that are carbon friendly, that actually sequester carbon. So there's a pretty bright future in just some of our traditional work going forward. In the pulp and paper area, the thing that's been happening and that we're moving into as a result of the markets that are really being demanded by society as a result of the climate issues. Um, you're seeing our pulp and paper mills move out of media papers and printing papers 
and more into packaging as an alternative to uh, plastics packaging and uh, certainly box board and shipping as our society moves towards maybe not traveling as much, there's a lot more e-commerce taking place. So um, there are other areas we wanna get into. IKEA is making more furniture and they may need medium density fiber board. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to uh, grow in this field as preferences by society move towards um, uh, climate friendly products. And then we have emerging forest products that are coming online uh, that are talked about in the climate action plan. Cross laminated timber is a big movement. Folks are interested in growing their houses now and uh, using more wood, not less in the structures. We're tapping into uh, residential and commercial um, interest in having uh, a kind of a bio um, uh, product and uh, maybe everybody is looking more at their carbon footprint and steel and concrete have a very heavy uh, carbon footprint. So there's opportunities for us to uh, bring cross laminated timber to Maine and uh, to market it. We do have buildings being built. University is working with nanocellulose is another example of uh, some of the directions we're going in. Um, the university we think is a hub. It's our, uh, it's our Silicon Valley really in Maine is to have that center of uh, research and development. And so nanocellulose um, actually can have additives to concrete and paper that makes it stronger. And we're looking perhaps at nanocellulose to take a look at coatings for paper that make them waterproof. Um, packaging uh, papers is gonna be stronger and stronger in Maine. And as we looked at uh, Maine's response to the COVID crisis, the mills that were into packaging and uh, coated papers and, and uh, cardboard did much better than those that weren't. So nanocellulose is uh, something that the public is demanding. Um, dissolving pulp is another thing. We have Sappy has a mill in um, Michigan that makes dissolving pulp and many of the clothes that some of you might be wearing from L.L. Bean uh, are a result of fibers taken from wood and recast into uh, fabric. So that's a future that has great opportunity for us. And we also uh, have Go Lab coming to Maine. Their equipment is uh, has arrived in Searsport and they are producing a wood insulation product. They're gonna be setting up shop in the old Madison mill, um, creating sort of products that include uh, forest-based uh, cellulose in them. So that's really important. Throughout the document, you also see reference to um, biofuels. And we have a lot of work going on with uh, Pyrolysis oil, for example, is being used now to heat Bates College. Uh, several of its boilers have been converted to pyrolysis oil, and that's coming from a uh, sawmill uh, located next to a refinery in Quebec. And we think those kind of opportunities are uh, ripe for Maine as well. So uh, you're going to see a lot of um, uh, matchups um, to the climate change model throughout the climate change plan from the uh, land issues to uh, manufacturing, there's a lot to be offered because of our state's uh, ability to, to be involved in the forest industry. And then my last slide is more of a con conceptual sort of putting this together. One of my members, uh, Bangkok Lumber, in, in their business, they're interested in having a home for every part of the tree, the tops, what we call biomass, the pulp, the logs, but they also produce residuals. And um, those residuals can fuel a lot of different, um, uh, that can be the substrate for a lot of different products. So if you look at this kind of schematic, you have a, uh, they're thinking about a combined heat and power plant that burns low grade materials, generates steam for their dry kilns. Uh, the electricity produced can actually be used for all their uh, sawmills, their retail stores. Um, and the um, 
it also can be a plant that gets involved with creating bio oil or biochar, which is actually something we can use to, to as an additive to soil to increase carbon content. And then any excess thermal heat can go to greenhouses or heating schools. This is sort of the vision of where we think uh, our industry is going into the future. And you can see how it relates to the climate change uh, model and plan that we have uh, going forward. So those were some of my thoughts uh, in describing our vision of how the forest industry, our forests and our manufacturers fit into the plan. And I'll see, I think you'll see this thread throughout the document and the opportunities uh, are happening in other parts of the world. We want them to happen here in Maine and uh, look forward to working with you folks on these endeavors and glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. Um, and when you have a moment, oh, there we go, perfect. Does anyone have any questions? I have one question. As a freshman legislator, I feel like I might be missing a few things as a result of the pandemic. And one is a tour of the university facility. I'm hoping we could get that on the to-do list after COVID passes. Highly recommended. Um, a lot of innovation taking place there and, and uh, sure they can do virtual tours, but it is, it is really fascinating. You can see there biggest uh, printer in the world, I think, uh, using wood products and printing ship hulls. And uh, you can see a lot of uh, innovation that's taking place. It, it, it's key to our forest industry future. Um, so it's, it's a great partnership and well worth the tour. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. All right. And I think then we'll move on to Ms. Law. Welcome, so nice to see you. Hi, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, okay, great. All right. Um, good afternoon, Senator Brenner, Representative Tucker and members of the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. My name is Melissa Law and I own Bumble Root Organic Farm, a small certified organic vegetable and flower farm in Wyndham. I'm also a member of the Maine Climate Council and participated on the Natural and Working Lands Working Group. As a young farmer, I view climate change as the biggest challenge my business will face in the decades to come. My goal in participating on the Climate Council is to help create bold policies that set new standards for climate action in our state. I bring a farmer's perspective to the conversation and I especially wanna make sure young voices are heard as future generations will bear the burden of the climate crisis. Farmers need support now because we have already begun to experience the impacts of the changing climate. I started my farm just six years ago and weather patterns have already become less predictable and storms more severe. In 2020, we experienced hailstorms, extremely high winds, and the serious drought that affected so many farmers across our state. We had a very late frost in early June, almost a month later than the frost date we base our planning on, and an unexpected early frost in September, making this one of the shortest growing seasons we've experienced thus far. This stands in contrast to the expectation that there will be longer growing seasons resulting from global warming, and it highlights the uncertainty of what is to come. According to climate projections for the state of Maine, looking to the future, farmers can expect hotter days and more of them, wetter wet years, drier dry years, and increased intensity of storms. The on-farm impacts of these changing weather patterns are numerous, increased pest and disease pressure, flooding and erosion, decreased yields due to drought, increased costs associated with irrigating fields and damage to infrastructure in the wake of severe storms. All of these impacts cause stress for farmers and financial losses for farm businesses, as so many of us experienced in 2020 due to the drought. Not to mention the pandemic. 
My work on the Climate Council has been focused on advocating for strategies that will help farm businesses while building a more resilient local food system. If farmers are to continue growing food for our communities, we need to find ways to both mitigate the worst possibilities and adapt to what is to come. Farmland protection is essential to ensuring that our state will be home to future generations of food producers. Farmland preservation protects valuable soils from development, preventing emissions, and allowing farmers to manage the land in a way that can combat climate change. Financial incentives will be critical to the widespread adoption of climate-friendly practices encouraging farmers to act with urgency and alleviating some of the risk inherent in investing in a new way of doing things. The co-benefits of adopting climate-friendly practices can't be understated. Increased soil health will lead to carbon sequestration, healthier crops and higher yields, and farm profitability and resilience. Providing increased technical assistance is an important part of educating farmers about these benefits. Service providers are adept at connect, connecting farmers with science, technology, tools, and examples that aid in the adoption of best practices. Research, innovation, and monitoring are critical to this process. There is strong evidence that agriculture can be part of the solution instead of contributing to the crisis, but we have much more learning to do. In addition to educating farmers about the value of climate-friendly practices, we must educate and engage with all Maine people about the urgency of this crisis. As we've heard today, climate change will impact every sector of Maine's economy and will touch every community in Maine. The Climate Action Plan's focus on equity will ensure that all of Maine's people are considered as Maine's most vulnerable communities will be hit hardest by the crisis. As Commissioner Beale, as Commissioner Beale mentioned, the plan also outlines the goal of strengthening Maine's local food system and increasing the amount of food consumed in Maine that is grown here from just 10% today to 30% by 2030. The pandemic has revealed the cracks that exist in our national food system and climate change will continue to deepen these fissures. It will undermine crop production, supply chains and food security our, across our country and the globe. Our reliance on food grown out of state and transported thousands of miles contributes to greenhouse gas emissions and makes us vulnerable to natural disasters and instability taking place in other regions. Finally, I just wanna say that for farmers, this is not an abstract threat that is looming somewhere in the future. We are feeling the impacts of climate change now. Agriculture has always been a huge part of Maine's identity and it will continue to play a critical role in Maine's communi communities, especially Maine's rural communities. Investing in farm resilience to climate change, be it through protecting farmland, supporting the implementation of soil health practices, or enacting legislation to strengthen our local food economy will help build better farm businesses and create food security in our state. A robust local food system will make our communities and our state more resilient to the challenges that lie ahead. Thanks so much for your time and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Melissa, that was great. Does anyone have any questions? All right, not seeing any. So we'll move on to Jesse. Thank you so much, Melissa. Welcome, Jesse. Hi there. <clears throat> can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. I don't have too many slides. I have a little bit of a show and tell later, but uh, it's a lot of pressure to be last. Um, so thanks to everybody for uh, enduring this day. And, and as you can see, there really, really has been a lot that has gone into this. And uh, I just wanted to highlight a few things that haven't been touched upon and, and uh, talk a little bit about the tourism economy and sort of the lens that that uh, brings to this. So again, I'm Jesse Perkins. I'm the executive director of the Bethel Area Chamber of Commerce over here in in Western Maine and uh, Bethel is of course known as a ski town, but really our tourism season feels almost never ending with brief breaks in like late April and early November because we really have uh, a, a lot going on in the summer and fall here as well. And um, I'll sort of 
get into to why that's important. Um, but our town is not now and never really has been purely about tourism. You know, we really have an active forest products industry and a lot of farms here in this area as well, both things that have been here for hundreds of years and things that have started up. So it's really a pretty diverse economy and gives a really interesting perspective on, on all these different things. Um, so I think we're talking about citizen engagement here. How do we how do we get the average person involved in thinking about these things and engaging in, in all these different strategies? And um, honestly, if we can make the climate and the environment something that people see, feel, work, play, touch, eat, uh, the more positively engaged they'll be in protecting these resources for the future. So what I love about this plan is that it is so, so specific to Maine. And as Mainers, we all know that we're very special and different and we don't need others to tell us what to do. We're gonna find our own way. Um, so that's really how this plan has, has come together. We also really value our history and our lifestyle and we'd be foolish to ignore those things as we move forward. Um, so one thing that we haven't talked about too much today is, is how important and how valued we, uh, we place the concept of equity throughout the development of this report. Uh, and I think that is super important to consider as, you know, this committee and, and others are thinking about what's, what are the programs and the funding mechanisms that go into implementing these ideas. Um, we really need to engage people of all income levels across all the geographies of Maine, uh, no matter what type of job they have, what type of home they have, whether they're owning, renting, uh, just moved here, been here for 100 years or more. Um, so, but you also can't, there's also certain lifestyle things that people just uh, need to acknowledge, which is, you know, I, if I can't get to my dad's camp down the steep rocky road, then, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to own a pickup until I can't, can't anymore, you know. Uh, people have identity uh, issues with uh, the way that they interact with the land and, and their lifestyle. So we really have to acknowledge that. Um, and, but we have to get ready for the day that, you know, someday there will be electric pickup trucks and we need to be, we need to have the infrastructure ready and, and get people used to that concept before they actually show up uh, and try to make them affordable when they do show up. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this report is, is, and what's interesting about how Maine's approach to climate um, adaptation and mitigation has been is, it says uh, we value individual responsibility and and the way that our um, the way that we are impacting the climate, with our our major impacts are coming from our housing and our transportation. Those are things that we can take charge of as an, on an individual basis. Um, so I think that that is it's important to to focus on that, and when, when we can do that. But then again, of a part of our big equation, as Dr. Fernandez pointed out earlier, is that we have this amazing forest that's incredibly resilient. And if that goes away, then that chips away, that chips at that side of the equation too. So protecting our forest should always be a huge priority. Um, I want to touch a little bit on like how the pandemic has changed things, even as we were writing this report. We only had two meetings before the pandemic, just sort of really just took the the wind out of our sails for a little while, but this process never stopped. And it, it's, it's really something to be proud of, uh, to the fact that this kept going throughout a total shift, a total U-turn in the economy, if you will. Um, but it also, it, the pandemic accelerated a lot of trends that we were just starting to look at and um, sort of created some living experiments that helped us sort of examine some trends as they were happening. Um, so, but it, it, this could really benefit us and it's gonna, I, I like to sort of project and think about how certain trends are, may pan out in the long term, such as, you know, previous to the pandemic, one of our biggest issues is that we had a very shrinking and aging population that was like collapsing in on itself and schools are trying to figure out how to stay open with fewer and fewer students and we're desperate to find ways to increase our workforce. And like, that's all we could think about for years, but boom, here's a pandemic. And locally our school population went up by 30 kids, which is huge. Um, and I know that that's not the only example. Um, the real estate market is crazy and the things that have been sitting on the market for 10 years are now all of a sudden just gone. And um, 
this is good in some ways, but it creates issues for our, our local people who are suddenly priced out of a market. Um, and, you know, it's also a lot of our second homes have become first homes. Uh, so in some ways that displaces some of the room that we used to have for tourists, even tourists having a hard time to come here. Um, and anyway, uh, the whole fantasy that we used to have of anyone could work from anywhere, why wouldn't they work from Maine, right? That used to be like a, an imaginary future. It's, it's now, it's happening right now. Um, so again, in the midst of designing this report, this big experiment has been going on and now we see how having more people working from home can make a big dent in carbon emissions and not to mention wear and tear on our roads. So an investment in broadband helps avoid costs associated with transportation. And now we have a picture of how public health can be good for the economy. You know, our ability to keep our population healthy and actually keep schools open, which is good, then people actually literally moving here just so their kids can go to school. It's, it's just shifting so many different things. Um, but it's also a preview of this idea that as climates to the south and west of us become too hot or they're flooded or they're on fire all the time, people, uh, very serious potential for a migration of people moving here because other climates elsewhere are less and less hospitable. So we become a more desirable place to live. Uh, it's all just sort of projecting, thinking, and how, you know, luckily this report is sort of setting the baseline for where do we go in the future. Um, and, but the pandemic has also showed us that we can move quickly if we really want to or really need to. Like we can, if we need to put resources uh, to a certain thing, we can do it. We've, we've, we've stretched ourselves in ways that we've never imagined before. Um, so how, how can we do that again, if necessary? Um, so getting back to uh, tourism, because yeah, not something we've discussed much today. Uh, it's kind of the elephant in the room when we talk about this stuff because we can calculate impacts of our stable population of 1.3 million people. But uh, in a quote unquote normal year, we would have upwards of 30 million tourists coming here. Uh, so we're vastly outnumbered. Uh, and once they're here, you know, if we don't have public transportation for them, then they're just sitting in their cars. If we don't have a place for them to, you know, get rid of their trash, then where does that trash go? Uh, how do we help hotels, motels, Airbnbs, you know, educate their customers about all these different things that we're doing and, and uh, you know, in, in many circles, showing that you're sustainable is a selling point um, for hotels, motels. As, as customers are increasingly looking for that, they get insulted if they don't have a place to put their recycling because at home, they're, wherever they came from, they're used to being able to sort that stuff out. So um, it's something to really, really think about. And again, it's, it's very difficult to calculate, but, but luckily we have this baseline now. Uh, another thing that has really, the pandemic has really accelerated is this serious pressure on our uh, outdoor trails, resources, um, you know, trailheads that are usually the ones that only the locals know about, or even those are packed in April this year you know, a time when they're never, it, they going outside is like the only thing left to do and you cancel everybody's baseball games and you cancel, you can't go to the movies and you're not going to the bowling alley, like going on the trails is like the last, oh, is, is that's what there is to do. Um, so again, like pre-pandemic, we're thinking, oh, in 10 years, you know, we're going to need to build out this and do this and have this more infrastructure, but we also need to educate people about um, how people who are coming here and visit and, and locals, how do they work together to protect the land that they value? Uh, and so a lot of tourism marketing campaign isn't even the right term for it, but very hot off the presses. And this is where I'll start to share my screen. Um, is this campaign called, uh, let's see, um, look out for me, the main office of tourism. If you're uh, familiar with it is, let's see, do, 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 do. where did I have it? Um, I'll share it. So if we can see this, um, you're going to, I really think that you're going to start to see more tourism campaigns be less about Bring everybody we can possibly think of to to Maine and you know 
just more and more and more all the time. And there's definitely a shift towards uh, getting people to respect the land once they're here. How do they get rid of their waste? Uh, respect the land, understand that a lot of this is private land, understand this is a working landscape and educating people before they come here and, and when they come here about, um, you know, you've come here for a reason. And uh, if you trample, if you ruin what you've come here for, then there's nothing for the rest of us. There's nothing for you to come back to. So main office of tourism has started doing this, which is amazing. Uh, let's see if I can scroll down a little bit. Um, but also even locally, we have worked with a committee to develop what we're calling the Mahusik Way, which is a, basically a pledge to, um, to protect the resources that you've come here to enjoy and get involved in the community. Uh, don't just come and, and, and be a taker, you know, give back um, and consider your impact as you're here. So I really think that you're going to start to see more tourism initiatives go in this direction, which is really a huge, huge shift from uh, previous, you know, just let's get as many bodies as we can here. Um, but even this money, uh, even this takes a change in thinking, a lot of signage, a lot of educational materials, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, planning and adjusting as we go, since it's really a pretty new concept, but it's something you're starting to see around the world. Um, so look into those if, if, if tourism is, is part of your wheelhouse, because they're two very new concepts. Um, so anyway, I really appreciate being asked to be here today and I, this is an incredible process. Of course, uh, the report, we didn't, we weren't just brought together to develop this report. Uh, it's actually a three-year commitment. We're going to continue to meet and monitor the, the situation. Uh, we have a three-year appointment. So, um, I hope that this isn't the last time that we meet with this committee and, um, again, thank you for, for letting me be a part of it and being here today. Thank you, Jesse, for your contribution to the project and to the report. Representative Judera has a question. Thank you. Thanks. That was very interesting. And, um, you know, you mentioned the uh, equity and the, and I see that there is an equity subcommittee that's going to be meeting this year. Are you part of that, Jesse? I just looked online quickly to see if I could see who was on that, but I, I didn't find it. And I'm just curious. I, I have, um, I can't say that I am, have been officially asked to be a part of that, but um, I, I just, I just wanted to bring that up because, um, you know, if, again, if we don't involve everybody possible throughout this process, it's, we're not going to be able to make the dent that we need to make. So um, it's important to remember too that yes, it does. These a lot of these things do sound expensive, so we have to find ways to engage everybody in getting there. Because eventually, as we know, uh, we your your home, your office, your vehicle becomes uh, more comfortable, more affordable, and lasts a lot longer. But you got to get over that initial investment hump, and uh, everybody. Mm -hmm. knows that. That initial investment, but then there's also the, the populations that are going to be disproportionately affected by climate change if we don't do things. So I'm sure. just curious, um, maybe Director Pingree knows about that. <laughs> yes, um, thank you for the question. And honestly, thank you, Jesse, and to our whole panel of, of Maine Climate Council members for giving up part of their day. Um, I think you, you realize why we put together a good and, and sort of diverse plan because we had such great people involved. So just to the equity point, um, I will say, you know, partway through our process, you know, we'd asked our working groups to focus on equity issues as a part of their recommendations. Um, as we did that work, we realized we needed to take it to another level. So we had the Mitchell Center, as Melanie mentioned, do a report. And then the, one of their suggestions was to appoint a specific equity subcommittee, sort of like science and technical that looks at all aspects of our climate implementation. Um, and so we actually have just named the co-chairs of that, um, Ambassador Molly and Dana, as well as Spencer Thibodeau, city councilor uh, from Portland are gonna co-chair that. Um, and we are working on naming the full committee with the two co-chairs help. And the idea for that group is that they meet on a regular basis and by the end of the year, um, add some additional equity metrics to our plan. So, you know, making sure 
how many low income households are we weatherizing? How do we increase that? Um, how are we re reaching out to the most vulnerable communities with the least resources to help them with their planning? So they'll be looking at all aspects. It will be an ongoing group. Um, and I think it's helpful to just mention, as Jesse said, the Climate Council continues to meet quarterly. We actually have a meeting next Wednesday and we'll move into a little bit more of a monitoring implementation stage support for the plan. Um, again, those are public meetings. We, you know, you'll be busy, but we, we welcome you at any of them um, to observe and, and participate. I know the speaker and Senate president are making new appointments uh, to the Climate Council um, and working groups. Our working groups will also continue to meet at least twice a year. Some are planning on meeting more often and they'll continue to work. work. You know, for example, the transportation group will be a stakeholder group for um, the clean transportation plan. The Natural Working Lands Group is already fully engaged in the work around forest carbon um, task force. So um, it will be ongoing, but obviously it's now the point where we're gonna be bringing bills and ideas and budgets and bonds to all of you. So again, I just wanna thank you all for your engagement. I really wanna thank all the members of the Climate Council who came today. Um, we really do look forward to this as a partnership with the legislature, you're fully involved you help make this happen. And, and again, we're, we're excited to continue um, the implementation and, and progress with all of you. Thank you so much. Oh, Representative Ziegler. Uh, yes, Hannah, thanks so much for the presentation. I just have a quick logistical question. I am on the EUT committee and you're gonna be presenting tomorrow. So is, the presentation going to be very similar today because we also have an AFA meeting that I'd like to be at. Um, and so would I be missing much by going to the AFA in the morning? I notice there's slight differences in the agenda. Uh, good question. Uh, so I will say there's, there's a lot of the same substance. It's a little more focused on mitigation and energy systems. Uh, in the first hour, we're having our modeling group. And again, we, this will be online and on YouTube for any of you who want to join. We have the Synapse, the modeling consultants who are going to go a little deeper into some of that information. Um, we're also going to talk about the clean energy economy report in a little more detail. But, but other than that, Representative Ziegler, it is a very similar overview summary. We probably should have worked to get everybody together at the same time, but it will have a more energy system focus. I felt like I was in the EUT earlier with some of the questions. A lot of migrating members, so that probably helps. <laughs> Wonderful. It's been a fantastic day. I'm so grateful for your time and your work on the report and appreciate the presentation very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Representative Tucker, do you have any parting words? Uh, just that um, we've been invited to go to the AFA um, meeting tomorrow to uh, take a look at the uh, the budget as it affects DEP and uh, and a FAME bill that that has environmental implications. And then I think we reconvene when next Monday. That's correct. Ten, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Dan. Yeah, so um, I, <laughs> I sent an email last night describing the change that I thought was going to happen for the supplemental budget hearing tomorrow. Um, that was our understanding in my office until this morning when this morning's block started. And so I really don't know what the plan is. Um, what happened today was what we're accustomed to for budget hearings where they're divided by committee subject matter. So they would list, you know, four committees. And if we were the third one to go, we would wait for our to start. Um, that's again, what happened today, but that's not how it was told to us last night. So it could change again, but right now I'm recommending if anyone wants to attend tomorrow, you should plan on joining at 10 in the morning um, using the link that was sent to you and then uh, and then if, if they are in fact taking it committee by committee, you can jump off and I'll keep watching and let you know when ENR is up. But I'm, I'm not really sure what is actually gonna happen tomorrow. Uh, and, the, and I did note in the email, the links you have uh, for that are 
unique to you. So if you were to use someone else's link, you would sign in at using that person's name. Um, so if you can't find your link, AFA is going to send them out again tomorrow morning. And then if you still can't find it tomorrow morning, let Sabrina or I know and we'll have them send it to you individually. Um, I think that's about it for tomorrow. I can answer any questions that anyone might have about tomorrow though. Representative <clears throat> Clear. Uh, yes, so Dan, okay. I want to be in I want to be on the EUT committee and part of it, and I want to not sit there through the whole AFA. So do I need two windows open? I need to zoom to the AFA, and then should I zoom to EUT and should I watch my internet connection blow up? I mean, how am I going to deal with this uh, if I want to deal with it? Um, that's you know, if I sit there, at 10, are, are you going to text me to say, um, you know, get on the, because I really do want to make sure that we get the funding uh, moved over uh, in the AFA tomorrow. Uh, so can you answer that, Dan? You always can answer all my questions. So I'm hoping yeah. you can answer that. <laughs> so so I, I will be on there at 10 and I will email everyone out once it appears how the meeting will be run. Um, so it, does EUT start at nine, I assume? Yes, nine. Um, so uh, just keep an eye open on your email and uh, and I'll try to update everyone at 10. Um, and I suppose you could jump between the two meetings if you want. Um, I'm not quite sure how legislators who are who need to be in two places at one time are planning on doing that if, you, if, if they're planning on you know, having two meetings actually open at the same time, if that's possible, I haven't tried it, or are jumping from one meeting to another. Or you could always, um, all of the YouTube feeds are recorded and then you can watch them later on for viewing. So if it's a meeting where you don't necessarily have to provide input like a briefing, uh, you could certainly watch that uh, uh, at your own convenience at a later time um, if you wanted to prioritize one meeting over another. Okay, thank you. And I always want to put very informative and important input in every meeting I go to, and people wait with bated breath for that, but I just may miss one of those meetings tomorrow. Anyone else have parting words? Last minute thoughts? Thank you so much for hanging in there for our long day together. And I think we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.